Thank you for watching the 16th annual Creighton School of Law Omaha Bar Association Seminar on Ethics and Professionalism. I'm Stephanie Hansen, your 2021-22 Omaha Bar Association President and a Douglas County Court Judge in Omaha. I don't want to stand in the way of your two hours of ethics to follow, but I do want to thank Scott Paul, Steve Suberson, and Creighton School of Law for all of their work in putting on this seminar. We are incredibly lucky to have such a dedicated team working together on this seminar year after year and a wonderful host in Creighton. On that note, we are excited to have already booked the Harper Center Auditorium for next April. And hopefully, if things are, keep going the way they are now, we'll be back in person. For those of you who missed Law Day lunch on May 2nd, it is available online for watching and good for one hour of free CLE in Nebraska for all OBA members and $10 for non-members. To watch it, go to the OBA website and click CLE On Demand. Thank you to you all for your membership and support of your local bar association and for watching this year's CLE. We look forward to seeing you in person at many other events that we're having this year. Check the OBA website uh, to find out what's coming next. Thank you. Welcome everyone. I'm Josh Frasche, and I'm proud to serve as the Dean of Creighton University School of Law. It is my honor to welcome you to the 16th Annual Creighton School of Law Omaha Bar Association Seminar on Ethics and Professionalism. I know it will be a great program, and while we're remote one more time, hopefully the flexibility of this program will help balance what we lose from not being together in the same space. I want to take a moment to recognize Scott Paul from McGrath North, and Creighton Law Professor Steve Sieberson for their great work in making this program what it is today. Steve and Scott were presented the Robert M. Spire Public Service Award for 2022. Congratulations to both of them on this well-deserved recognition. It was another challenging year for all of us and our Creighton Law students were no different. Despite the challenges, we had a big year at Creighton Law. We were excited to begin our Juvenile Justice Legal Clinic, where our students working with our outstanding faculty provided critical services to Omaha's youth who had open cases in the separate juvenile court of Douglas County. This is an exceptional learning and service opportunity for our students and our community. I was also excited to celebrate graduation with the Creighton Law Class of 2022 on May 13th as we recognized their accomplishments. They were thoughtful, resilient, and committed and made it through a remarkable time. Our inspiring students showed us their enthusiasm and dedication and watching them navigate these difficult times convinces me that we're in good hands for the future. My thanks to Scott Paul and Steve Sieberson, as well as Dave Summers and the Omaha Bar Association for making this event a possibility. I know this year will be another excellent program. Enjoy it, and I hope to see you again soon. I've been thinking about this uh, presentation and want to take a slightly different approach than I often do, where I cover kind of a black letter rules of ethics uh, rules of professional conduct where I cover them in some depth. And I wanted to step back from all of that and uh, say that we often think of the rules as kind of a warning or a disciplinary code. And uh, it's not just that. Uh, I think if we look at the rules from a particular slant, uh, we can see them as guidelines for us. That is affirmative, positive guidelines for how we practice law. And what I'm thinking of them then is as guidelines for your success as a lawyer. And I don't mean by success, I don't mean, did you win your case? Did you close your transaction? I don't mean that kind of success. What I'm really talking about is did you have a successful relationship with your client? That is, were you able to provide services to them? Again, not win or lose, but were you able to provide services to them in a positive and helpful way? And did they come away feeling that you were providing good service? So we're going to talk then about the relationship with your client and how the ethics rules can help you in setting that relationship. So here are the steps uh, I'm going to follow today. First of all, let's start with initiating the relationship. How does it come into being? 
Uh, secondly, I'm going to talk about being clear about your fees. Now we hear a lot about the rules on fees, but I'm going to talk about fees as a form of communication really. Uh, that leads to the third point, which is maintaining good communication in general throughout your relationship with the client. Fourth, we're gonna deal with the issue that happens often enough that it bears repeating, I think, and that is how do you manage multiple clients? And what if there are multiple lawyers involved? How do you manage that? And finally, we get to the point where the relationship with the client is wrapping up. So let's start then with managing the relationship. Uh, sorry, uh, Dave, you're gonna cut that out and I'm gonna say, let's start then. I'm sorry, my mouse is misbehaving. I'll see if I can do this with my buttons. Okay, we're gonna go back from the title slide and, let's, and I'm going to say, let's go to the outline. We're going to look first at initiating the relationship. How is a lawyer-client relationship formed? We have a rule called Rule 1.18 that defines what is a prospective client. Dave, my, uh, my buttons are just going crazy. And so we're gonna go back to the title slide and say, and go on from the title slide to the outline. So we're gonna look at five aspects of a successful relationship. Initiating it, being clear about your fees, maintaining good communications, uh, managing multiple clients, which is a common thing, or having multiple lawyers involved, and then wrapping up the relationship. So let's begin with initiating the relationship. It has to be created at some point. How do you attract new clients? Uh, well, uh, we're going to look at four rules that have to do with bringing clients in the door. Uh, they don't necessarily talk about how you deal with those clients. It really has to do with uh, creating the relationship and attracting them in the first place. Well, look, we've got the four rules on advertising and solicitation. Uh, rule 7.1 says that communications have to be truthful. Well, in fact, what it says is that, a that you may not make a false or misleading communication about yourself or your services. And then it uses some interesting language here. It says a communication is false or misleading if it contains a material representation of fact or law or omits a fact necessary to make the statement considered as a whole not materially misleading. Now, if that sounds like awkward language, I want to remind you that that comes right out of securities law and the famous rule 10b-5, so that you may not make false statements and you may not omit material information when you are selling securities. Well, they've chosen that same language so you not only have to not lie or mislead in your communications, you also can't hide the ball. That is, you may not fail to communicate true things about yourself. Um, rule 7.2, basically this permits all kinds of forms of advertising. Uh, it says you may advertise through written media, recorded or electronic, media and through public media. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the different ways that, that lawyers are advertising these days. Um, lawyers are blogging and so on. Uh, and lawyers are posting on their uh, LinkedIn pages, on their Facebook pages and so on. All of that is okay, subject to the 
Rule 7.1. Now, Rule 7.2 has to do with referral fees. It says you may not give anything of value for someone recommending your services. So referral fees are not allowed. There are some limitations for a small fee. You might pay a lawyer referral service or something like that. But essentially, uh, if a lawyer sends you a big case, you cannot pay them a chunk of the fee as a referral fee unless you associate them on the case and they do a certain amount of work. Uh, rule 7.3 is an interesting one. It prohibits direct solicitation. And we know all about the ambulance chasers and the lawyers who are passing out cards in emergency rooms and that sort of thing. That's more of a myth, I hope, than, than reality. But the fact is, uh, direct, live, face-to-face, -face, or, or real-time, that would be online, over the phone, direct, live solicitation is prohibited or it's really limited for now. And I say for now, because the model rules of professional conduct have deleted rule 7.3 and a number of states have joined in. And I understand that Nebraska is looking at it. And so uh, I will defer here to our third speaker today, Scott Paul, who, is, who has been serving on a committee looking at rule 7.3, he can give an update. Let's talk about the first contacts you might have with a prospective client. Now rule 1.18 is one of the newer rules in the model rules or in the Nebraska rules. And it defines a prospective client. And the whole purpose of rule 1.18 seems to be on confidentiality. Let's say you meet a potential client and they tell you a lot of information, that's gotta be kept confidential as if they were a client. And then you have to deal with conflicts of interest. If you meet a potential client and halfway through the meeting, they've given you a lot of information and you discover that they're in conflict with one of your other clients, you may have conflicted yourself out of uh, representing both parties. So uh, rule 1.18 does define then a lot of aspects of confidentiality and conflict of interest. However, it does not go into formation. It doesn't tell you if you have actually formed a relationship or pro a professional relationship with this prospective client now client. Uh, in the preamble to the rules, uh, that is even before rule 1.0, in the preamble, it says that principles of substantive law external to these rules determine whether a client lawyer relationship exists. In my mind, that puts us into contract law and we're really going back to the first day of law school and we're talking about offer and acceptance. So whether you have an actual agreement with your client to represent them uh, depends on what you've said and what they've said. So they may say to you, I want you to represent me and that that would be the offer. Do you accept that? And then how do you define the details? Uh, rule 1.16 is one other rule that helps us and that talks about when you have to decline representation. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but you have to decline representation if it would violate the rules. Uh, for example, conflict of interest. Uh, if you're not capable of doing the representation or if, uh, if, the, if you've started representing and the client fires you, uh, you may not continue, but essentially, the uh, rule 1.16 as rule 1.18 tends to focus on confidentiality and conflict of interest. Now, the next question is, is it a client or is it not a client? And uh, one of my favorite cases is from Minnesota in 1980, and it's called the Tokstad case. That should be enough of a name if you want to look it up. 
uh, in this case, uh, a Mrs. Tugstad, whose husband had been injured in a hospital, met with a law firm to talk about perhaps a malpractice accident, uh, uh, action, excuse me, a malpractice action against the doctors and the hospital. So the law firm, law firm, let's call them law firm A, uh, had a one hour meeting with her, discussed the case, and the attorney for law firm A said, I don't really think you have a case, but I will discuss it with my partners. And if we change our mind on that, we'll get in touch with you. Well, he never did get in touch with them, with the, the woman, Mrs. Tugstad. Well, so she concluded that they had given her advice and that they had told her she had no case and she let it sit. About a year later, and we don't, I don't know from the facts of the case, what caused her to rethink that conclusion. But she went to a second law firm and that's law firm B. And apparently they knew more about uh, medical malpractice and they looked at her case and said, yes, you've got a great case, but oops, the statute of limitations has expired on your husband's personal injury claim. And so we'll be happy to sue that first law firm for you. So now you get the story uh, they did sue, and the law firm, the first law firm, A, ended up paying over $600,000 to Mrs. Tugstad's husband, and to her, I suppose it was a loss of consortium claim or something, uh, she got $39,000. Uh, the Minnesota State Supreme Court affirmed the trial court's judgment against law firm A. Well, you can just see what happened. A client comes in the door, you discuss it with them, and, and you either say something like, I don't think this is a case for us. Now, if you do that, it's probably a little bit clearer than it was in Tokstad that you have no intention of representing this person. But if you say, well, I don't think this is a case for us, and frankly, I don't think you've got much of a case there. Now, what have you done? You've gone ahead and given advice, and the client walks out the door thinking you've given them advice. That may have inadvertently created a, uh, an attorney-client relationship. So be very careful in an intake session about not giving casual advice. And here's where I would say the critical thing, of course, is an engagement letter. Now, in the Tokstad case, if they had decided to go forward, they would have prepared, prepared an engagement letter for the woman. Uh, but they said, well, maybe we'll get back to you. Well, your engagement letter, if you're going forward, should identify what you're going to do and what your fees are and that sort of thing. I'll have more to say about that later. But how about a non-engagement letter? You know, this Tokstad case would have gone away if law firm A had written a memo, a follow-up memo to that one hour consultation to Mrs. Tokstad and said, uh, thank you for meeting with us. Uh, we, we are not the firm to represent you. Uh, we believe you should try another law firm. And uh, sometimes lawyers will actually throw out the names of several other law firms and suggest that you contact one of them. Uh, a non-engagement letter. I don't think it happens very often. I don't know if law firm A in the Tugstad case started doing them after this judgment of $650,000. Well, let's go on to the second point and that is being clear about your fees. So let's say you've done the intake, you've got the client uh, engaged, you've been engaged by the client, now we need to talk about your fees. Now, I'll remind you, Rule 7.1 says that all communications regarding your services have to be true and not misleading and not omit anything, all communications. That would include anything you tell a prospective client or an actual client about your fees. They've got to be, your, your statements have to be true and complete. 
Uh, rule 1.5 is the main fee rule uh, in the rules of professional conduct and 1.5a says your fees have to be reasonable. Actually, what it says is you may not charge an unreasonable fee. Uh, now, the reasonable standard, there are seven or no, eight items listed in rule 1.5a that tell you what's reasonable or not. And they include things like uh, your time and labor involved, your skill, your reputation, the size and urgency of the matter, uh, is taking on a particular matter going to prevent you from working on other matters? And then there's that local standards. So if, if the standard hourly rate in town seems to be in the $100 to $200 range and you're going to charge a client $500 an hour, uh, that may be unreasonable based on where you are. Now, your own time, skill, reputation, and all of that could possibly uh, change that uh, conclusion. It's all going to be very fact specific. I assure you of that. Uh, rule 1.5b says uh, you should uh, make your fee clear, preferably in writing. Now, we know it goes on to say, uh, Rule 1.5 goes on to talk about contingent fees and how contingent fees always have to be in writing. Well, where Rule 1.5b says the scope of representation and the basis or rate of the fee and expenses for which the client will be responsible shall be communicated to the client, preferably in writing, it says before or within a reasonable time after commencing representation. So I guess you could make an oral fee agreement and follow it up with a writing fairly soon afterwards. But I think the preferably in writing is, uh, in my opinion, misspoken. I think it should be always in writing. I think every fee agreement should be in writing. And since this is a contract, remember your relationship with your client is going to be based on contract law. I would say have every client countersign every single engagement letter. Uh, there is case law that says you don't quote a flat fee, for example, and then later send a bill and add a bunch of expenses and other charges that weren't identified. Uh, now that, that does bring up other examples of bad fee arrangements or bad billing, if you will, padding your bills, uh, surcharges on services paid to contract lawyers. Let's say you hire a contract lawyer at $100 an hour, you charge, you pay that and you charge the client 120 for your overhead, not permitted. Uh, too many lawyers involved working inefficiently, double billing the same research to two different clients. Uh, now, all of it is going to be fact specific and, and Normally, when you get into a fee dispute, I would say you've not been clear enough. And now we, we're talking, aren't we, about the relationship. And if you're going to have a good relationship with your client, you need to be on the same page when it comes to fees. And that's where your engagement letter comes in. And I'll have a little more to say on billing in just a second. Uh, incidentally, if you violate the unreasonable fee rule of 1.5a, it could subject you to discipline. Lawyers aren't commonly disciplined for unreasonable fees, but you may very well be required to disgorge the fees if you've collected them, or you will be denied the opportunity to collect them if you haven't yet. Well, uh, rule one point. Here we go. 1.7A2. Um, oh, excuse me. I jumped back. There we are. Accounting. Accounting to the client. This is actually a special rule in Nebraska. It's not in the model rules. 1.5F. Upon request, a reasonable and timely request, you have to provide an accounting to your client. An itemization of all charges, detailed description, description of the services performed, 
and uh, you're not allowed to charge for this. It says you have to provide this accounting without charge. Well, uh, it seems to me, rule 1.5F, thank you, Nebraska, for putting this in place. It is simply best practices to do this. And it isn't just that you're waiting for the client to ask for an accounting. My recommendation strongly is Give an accounting in every bill you send out. So you do this monthly. If you're sending out monthly bills, you're going to include a description of your charges, a description of your services, and you're going to make it clear to the client. They'll never have to ask you for an accounting if you do this routinely as part of your billing. And by the way, uh, as a best practice in billing, I would say always include a cover letter. Uh, cover letter just seems to me to be a courtesy and professional, and it's a great form of communication with your client. So what about if you might increase your fee during representation? You know, it's a long project. It's, you, your law firm has just increased its hourly rates across the board. What if you contact the client and say, uh, by the way, my hourly rate's gone up from 100 to $125, uh, and that'll be what I'm charge you, charging you from now on. Well, rule 1.7A2 strongly suggests that, if, that this is a business transaction and you have a conflict of interest at this moment. And rule 1.8A, goes into business transactions with a client. Now we often think about, are you buying into a client's deal or buying something from the client, selling something to the client? Actually, your fee arrangement is considered a business transaction. Now at the outset, when you set it originally and, and the client is not your client yet on that matter, you're not in a conflict position. You can set your rates and the client can agree or disagree or negotiate. But once you're underway and you increase your fee without the client's consent, this is a conflict of interest. There's a presumption of undue influence. How's the client going to argue with you? Uh, if you're going to do a business transaction, Rule 1.8 suggests, makes it clear that you have to advise your client to seek independent counsel have them sign in, in, an informed consent agreeing to the business transaction. And how are you gonna do that in the middle of a project with a client with regard to your own fees? Now, one thing that is suggested is that in your fee agreement letter, you might say words to the effect that your law firm routinely evaluates its fees. And if there's going to be an uh, across the board annual fee increase that is hourly rate increase that your client matter will be subject to that. Now, that's an interesting prospect. Uh, ask yourself how you would feel if you're going into a service provider and are told that this is what the rate is going to be. But if we choose to increase it, uh, you're going to have to pay that. Um, if your engagement letter says that you can increase the fees uh, unilaterally and the client reads, actually reads and signs the engagement letter, what is the client gonna say when they get to that paragraph? So uh, the, the main point is a fee increase isn't just a matter of how much you're charging, but it's part of your relationship with a lawyer. You really wanna get a lawyer frustrated, just send them a letter one day and say, by, by the way, our, our rates have gone up and they've never anticipated that. Well, a couple of final thoughts on the practice of billing. Think of it as public relations. Remember where I said, always have a cover letter, send a cover letter with your bill. Why not say something like, here's our bill. Uh, we've made big progress this month or this is what we've done this month. Uh, it's been an honor to serve you. Please contact me if you have any questions. It's a form of public relations. It's a way to keep your relationship going smoothly. Another suggestion is don't bill something unless you've actually accomplished something concrete. 
I'll give you a quick example. I brought a client in the door at one of my firms and it was a project that I handed over to another attorney. She was a partner and uh, it was late in the building cycle. So toward the end of the month and she got the file and she did a little bit of research and she sent the clients a bill. She hadn't sent them a single piece of paper. She sent them a bill and they called me and said, wait a minute, we just got a bill. You've only had this file for two days. What are you doing? We lost that client. We lost that client. And I, I was very careful after that to make clear that anytime I ever sent out a bill, I had to be able to show something for it. Um, and ask yourself always, how would, you re how would you react if you received a bill? Um, I got a bill from a contractor recently who was doing some work on my house. Uh, and I looked at the first bill and there was an overhead charge. I went back and looked at the contract and yes, they mentioned overhead, but uh, they charge 15% on every subcontractor. I guess that's standard. Uh, they charged 15% on top of all their hourly rates. I wasn't anticipating that. I called the owner of the company. I said, what is this? And he said, well, we got to keep the doors open. Well, at the next time, I got a bill that included time, a time charge for the office staff preparing the bill. And on top of that time charge for the bill, they added 20% overhead. So for goodness sakes, um, I was not happy. So always ask yourself, what is the client uh, going to think about how I bill? Well, let's go on to ongoing communication. You can see that I think very strongly that billing is a form of communication and it can help make or break the quality of your relationship. But let's talk about other aspects of communication. Um, rule 1.2 talks to us about uh, letting the client choose the objectives of the uh, representation, but it says you must consult with your client on tactics. That's a form of communication. You're obviously going to consult with the client and how you're going to handle their matter, whether it's litigation or otherwise. Uh, 1.4 has two types of communications in it, proactive and reactive. So the proactive part says you will promptly inform the client if, they're, if they need to make a decision on something. You will reasonably consult with them on the means, that is the tactics of what you're doing. That's tracks rule 1.2. Uh, and you reactively, you will promptly comply with reasonable requests for information. Uh, lastly, you will explain a matter in enough detail to allow your client to make decisions. Uh, comment five says you don't need to explain every detail, but it's going to depend on the significance of the transaction, the sophistication of the client, and the number of details that are there. If it's a very complex matter, obviously you and the client need to have some ground rules about how much detail you're going to share. practice of communication. This is just a few practical bits of advice. At the outset, when, you're, uh, when the client is coming on board, you want to discuss how you're going to communicate. These days, it's a little complicated. Are you going to communicate by email? Letters, not so much anymore. They take too much time. Are you going to con uh, communicate by phone? I think most people these days don't want to get phone calls that much. How about texting? Uh, gosh, if I were still in practice, I don't think I would want to get texts all the, texts all the time from my clients. Uh, email is a little more formal. I kind of like that. And there are ways to communicate with people on social media. So you need to discuss with your client uh, what their expectations are and what's most comfortable for both of you in how you go back and forth. Uh, for some clients, and I know people who are dealing uh, in the criminal defense area, uh, family, family law matters and, and uh, things that are really personal to people, lawyers have to be very careful about the amount of communication they're getting because uh, people who are stressed out and 
don't understand that maybe there's more than one client that you're working with, uh, they're going to call you every day and you need to set some barriers uh, there in terms of how it's going to work. So you, I think that's something to do upfront in your, you don't need necessarily need to put it in the engagement letter, but it's certainly something you talk about at the beginning of a matter. And then how quickly should you respond? Uh, 20 years ago, maybe a little over 20 years ago, I was in Seattle practicing and uh, one of our firm clients was Microsoft. And, you know, that's a pretty hard charging company. And the people that worked there were constantly working all nighters and, and, you know, communicating at the speed of light. I think Bill Gates put it, uh, working at the speed of thought or something like that. Uh, the question is how quickly should you respond? I, I certainly had a shock one day. I got a phone call from one of the clients at Microsoft saying, why haven't you responded to your email? And I said, oh gosh, when did you send it? And he said, five minutes ago. So um, something that you need to sort of feel your way into with your client, what are they expecting? What are they demanding? What are you capable of? Uh, another practice is copy the client on all uh, exchanges with third parties, uh, copy them on letters and documents, uh, follow up every meeting with a memo, every meeting you have with a client. And if it's a critical meeting with a third party, follow it up with a memo to the client. Uh, I also think you should communicate during lulls in the action. And maybe you're not going to bill, but maybe it wouldn't hurt to send a note to a client at the end of a month saying, uh, because we're waiting for the other party to respond to our discovery demands, uh, we haven't been able to do anything further this month, just thought we'd let you know. Um, and as I've said earlier, monthly billing uh, is a good form of communication and uh, monthly uh, cover letter are excellent. So now let's talk about managing uh, multiple clients and multiple lawyers. Multiple clients in a matter. Uh, it, it's quite common to represent more than one client on the same transaction. Maybe it's a couple of partners in a deal. Maybe it's two people that are buying a house together or something. Uh, the rules uh, run point seven in the comments refer to common representation. You won't find anything, and 1.7, you'll recall, is conflict of interest. Uh, 1.7 in the black letter of the rule says nothing about multiple clients, but there are five comments that I've identified here, 29 to 33, on common representation. Uh, they're quite detailed, these comments, but I'm going to try to summarize them in just a few minutes. Uh, comment 29, if you have multiple clients and a conflict arises within the group, you're going to have to withdraw. You're not going to be able to choose sides and represent one of your clients against the other. Uh, and you're going to have to make that kind of clear at the beginning in your first meetings and in an engagement letter that if a conflict arises within the group, uh, you're not going to be lawyer for any of them. Uh, rule or uh, comment 30 talks about limits on the attorney client privilege. Uh, in fact, within the group, there is no privilege. Uh, that is what one client tells you isn't privileged uh, with regard to the other clients. Uh, 31, comment 31 talks about confidentiality and it's a similar thing. Uh, you need to make it clear to your group of clients that any information one of them gives you, you will share with the others. Uh, that's, uh, there are some limits there. There are some limits. So for example, if you're working with a group of clients who are putting a business project together and one of the clients wants to talk to you about their estate planning, that can be confidential because it doesn't relate to the common representation. But with regard to the project, Everything's got to be shared and there is no privilege. Uh, rule 30, uh, comment 32 uh, reiterates that you can't favor one client over another. And particularly 
um, uh, the comment goes on to say that within a group representation, that puts a little more responsibility on the group members to make decisions because you can't pull them aside and advise them. Uh, with all of those limitations, you owe a duty, according to comment 33, a duty of loyalty and diligence to each one of your clients. Well, loyalty only goes so far and it's always subject to all those limitations on the previous comments. Well, some practical advice when you're dealing with multiple clients, explain the limits on confidentiality and privilege, that's gonna be fun. Um, always discuss your role and your limitations that you're not individual clients, lawyers, you're a lawyer for the group, or if they're forming an entity, that's easy. You're representing the entity. Uh, be very aware of having third parties in client meetings. So if you have, say, a group of three clients, you're representing them, and one of them wants to bring a family member to the meeting, be careful. You're about to blow privilege. Uh, you have to set expectations for communications. How do you communicate with multiple clients? Uh, I just did an exercise in one of my classes where we're, we were negotiating a, trans, a hypothetical transaction and I had each team designate one of the members of the team as the chief communicator. Uh, it's good to have a conduit for communications. Now, that doesn't mean you can't all agree that any one of the clients in the group can't call you. Uh, set rules for how decisions are going to be made within the group. You're going to advise, oh, here's something we need to make a decision on. Will you guys let me know? Um, the engagement letter ought to be signed by all the clients. And uh, one last point here, don't ever try to represent a seller and a buyer on the same transaction. There's just no way you can be appropriately diligent and loyal on behalf of everybody. So how about multiple lawyers in a matter? Uh, sometimes you'll have lawyers with different specialties uh, representing a client. Uh, sometimes you'll have a primary lawyer and then a secondary lawyer brought on for some additional work. Uh, the rules don't say much about multiple lawyers and a single client, for example. There is an opinion, it's ABA formal opinion 98411 and uh, it talks about consultations. Uh, so let's say you're a lawyer, you're L1, and you are gonna bring in a second lawyer to consult on some matter of law. Is that lawyer co-counsel with you or not? If they are co-counsel, then they have direct obligations to the client and it gets more complicated. On the other hand, if you're just going to consult with this lawyer to get a point of law, to get a little help, a little advice from a friend. Uh, best to keep those discussions hypothetical, but you don't have to then consider that second lawyer who's just giving you some advice as co-counsel. Now, if you're gonna share confidential information with a second lawyer, and if you're gonna have that second lawyer bill you and you pass that charge on to your client, now the client should consent to that and uh, you may have created at that point a co-counsel relationship. It's not easy. Uh, think about all of the relationship aspects you have with one client, you one lawyer with one client, add a second lawyer and things start getting complicated. So uh, a little bit of practical advice on this. I've already said, if you're gonna do more than just a, a quick phone call to a friend to get some advice on something, uh, you're gonna to have to get the client's consent if lawyer number two is coming in and is going to join in the representation. Then lawyer two will have to run a conflicts check. And when you bring lawyer two into the project, now you're gonna to have to set out the details of who's doing what. You're gonna to have to perhaps make a new engagement letter Describe the scope of work you're going to do. What is the other lawyer going to do? Responsibilities, team leadership, and so on. 
uh, who's going to handle communications? I wrote a whole law review article on rule 1.4 on communications, dealing with multiple lawyers representing a single client. Uh, it's a detailed and granular law review article. Uh, and of course, you're going to want to discuss fee and billing arrangements if there's more than one lawyer involved. Uh, does the second lawyer bill the client directly or do they bill through you the way a subcontractor bills, bills through a general contractor? Uh, who's going to have to write the check for that second lawyer's uh, services? Well, let's go to wrapping up the relationship. So we talked about how to get a successful relationship started, how to be successful on uh, billing, how to be successful on communication. Well, at some point, uh, every, all good things come to an end. We do have some rules on withdrawal. Now, 1.16, has to do with, with withdrawal when you must terminate representation. For example, if you're continuing, representation would violate the rules. You've got a conflict problem or the client is misbehaving or if the client discharges you, now you must withdraw. Uh, rule 1.16b talks about may withdraw and that's really more where the client's behavior comes in in any event, 1.16D says, if you're going to withdraw, and now we're talking about during the middle of a representation, it's not concluded, so this is just preparatory. You have to always take steps to protect the client's interest. You must always uh, make sure that if you're withdrawing, because even if you've been fired, that the client gets copies of the files and, and that uh, there's a kind of a transition time to the other attorney and that you help the transition. And that may be uncomfortable, but that's what the rules require. You have to take steps to protect the client's interest. And don't forget that your confidentiality requirement carries on even after the representation ends. Uh, you're, you're always going to be bound by confidentiality, even after the client dies, according to uh, case law. So let's go back to that previous slide. All right. Um, I'm looking for the slide. There it is. So if you're not fired or if you don't quit in the middle of withdraw is the word in the middle of a transaction. If, if there's nothing formal that's been done, what are your responsibilities? Well, rule 1.3 says you have to conclude all matters. 1.3 is the diligence rule. And uh, comment four says you have to conclude all matters. But now I'm going to raise what I think is a little bit of a novel question perhaps. What if the matter is concluded? Are you still the client's lawyer? Well, I've, in the previous slide, I mentioned that confidentiality carries on. To, so to some extent, that rule of confidentiality carries on even if the matter is done. Just because you've finished the case and, and you've closed the files doesn't mean you can now break the confidentiality. So to, to that extent, you still have responsibilities, but we can ask the question, are you still the client's lawyer? What makes a continuing uh, relationship? Well, uh, the suggestion in rule 1.2 on scope of representation is that you can you can in, at the outset say, I'm going to represent you on this litigation matter, or I'm going to represent you generally. Now, when does the relationship end? But if you've concluded a matter, I would like you've closed the deal, uh, you've, uh, your case in court has concluded. I guess most people would think, well, sure, uh, 
our relationship is over, I'm done. But what does the client expect? I wanna use a doctor analogy here. Let's say you've gone to a specialist doctor, uh, a dermatologist, and you've had some treatments and everything's uh, all good again. Ask yourself, is that doctor still my doctor? I'm not going back every year for a checkup, but what if in three years, I have another problem that requires a dermatologist. Was that doctor during that whole period of time still my doctor? Well, I think most patients would say yes. Once they're your doctor, they're always your doctor unless you move or they leave or something. But what makes a continuing relationship? Well, the uh, rule 1.2 says you can limit the scope of representation. And so you can limit how far your client relationship goes. But um, I would say if there's any doubt about whether your relationship continues, if there's any doubt about it, you may have to send a termination letter. Now I'm wondering if anybody's ever really done that. I think one way that we could handle it is in a cover letter with the final bill saying, we have concluded your transaction and closed our copies of all the deeds that have been recorded. Uh, you now have a binder with all the closing documents. And of course, you're gonna say something like, it's been an honor to work with you and to be your attorney in this transaction. Thank you for using uh, this law firm. Well, if you couch it in the right way, I think you could say that that final cover letter with that final bill is a term termination letter. But if you ever uh, have doubts as to the, whether if you're done with a client and you really don't want to represent them any further, I would say you need to find a way to communicate that. Now, one of the facts of life is that most lawyers don't want to get rid of uh, clients. That is to say, if you do a client uh, some service at one time, you would like to get more work out of them. That's part of uh, how law practices are built, how clientele are built. So you want, so the idea of a formal withdrawal or ending the client relationship isn't really that appealing to most lawyers. On the other hand, there may be clients uh, that you didn't enjoy working with and you're done with their transaction or their case and you're happy enough uh, never to see them again. Well, you still have to put yourself in their shoes. Maybe they were miserable to you and you didn't like working with them, but maybe thought you, they thought you were fine. Maybe they thought you were a good lawyer and they would like to have you carry forward. So uh, all I'm saying is that part of a successful relationship between you and your client is you and your client coming to an agreement as to whether the relationship is over. A successful breakup, if you will, or just a conclusion is a little less harsh to think of it that way. And so uh, every client relationship has phases, doesn't it? There's the courtship phase where you're trying to bring the client in the door. There's the uh, engagement phase where you're doing the project and then there's the wrapping it up phase. And uh, frankly, in all of my years of practice, I never really gave a lot of thought to any formality in the wrapping up phase. Uh, most of the clients I worked with were business clients and I was always hoping to get another deal from them. Uh, so if I sent them a final bill on a particular project, uh, I would say something like, thank you for letting me work with you on this transaction. I'll look forward to another one in the future. Uh, so, uh, but, but I don't know that I ever had a breakup with a client that was contentious. So I never had to think about a formal withdrawal or a formal termination at the end of a project. So uh, think about the phases of the relationship you're in. It's all about communication, really. If you, if you had to sum it all up, whether it's building or creating the relationship and so on, I think it's all about communication.
treat your client as a person who deserves your time and attention. You're charging them for it after all and make sure they know what you're doing because uh, there's no client that's unhappier than a client who gets a bill with no idea what it's for. So I will conclude with that. And I thank you for listening today. And I know you will enjoy the next two speakers. Thank you. My name is Chris Opperly, and I'm the director of the Nebraska Lawyers Assistance Program. And I'd like to thank Scott Paul for his uh, invitation uh, for me to be part of the 16th annual OBA seminar on ethics and professionalism. And I'd also like to thank uh, Dave Summers for his assistance in putting this seminar together. And so for the next 30 minutes, I'm going to talk about the intersection of attorney well-being and ethics. And as that name implies, we're going to talk about the interrelation between um, our well-being, in other words, our mental, emotional, physical health, and our ability to comply with the ethical code of our profession. And not just to meet our ethical requirements, but also to be the best we can uh, for the clients that we serve. A little bit of background about me. I'm a 1992 graduate of Creighton Law School. I spent the early part of my career working in private practice, uh, then transitioned to in-house counsel, spent about 14 years as in-house counsel before becoming the second director in the history of the Nebraska Lawyers Assistance Program in 2017. My inter uh, interaction with NLAP goes back farther than that. I was a volunteer on the NLAP committee from 2001 to 2017, chaired that committee on a couple occasions. And then my first interaction with NLAP was actually in 1998. Uh, as a young lawyer, six years into the profession, I was struggling and I reached out to NLAP for help. And uh, from that experience, I understand the, the value of having a help resource like the Nebraska Lawyers Assistance Program for our lawyers, judges, and law students. So I mentioned 2017, I became the uh, director of, this, of the NLAP program. Uh, coincidentally, that's the same year that the ABA Task Force on Lawyer Wellbeing uh, published its comprehensive report entitled A Path to Lawyer Wellbeing, Practical Recommendations for Positive Change. And basically that report looked at the overall state of, of, of lawyer well-being within our profession and then it came up with recommendations on how our profession should move forward in order to pro promote stronger well-being among our lawyers, judges, and law students. One of the core principles that came out of that, uh, and recommendations that came out of that report was to emphasize well-being as an indispensable part of a lawyer's duty of competence. In other words, we can't serve the people that we serve unless we take care of ourselves first. Um, the Nebraska Supreme Court has also recognized the correlation between uh, attorney well-being and, and the you know, meeting our ethical requirements uh, and, the, and, the, and the ability to serve our clients. Uh, they do that a couple different ways. First, they, they provide their uh, financial support for the Nebraska Lawyers Assistance Program as well as their, their support in providing us with, with guidance and uh, ideas on how we can best serve the lawyers, judges, and law students of our state. Uh, they also amended the MCLE rules in 2017 to include uh, well-being topics like mental health, emotional health, uh, gambling, uh, substance use disorders. Uh, those topics now are included within the uh, definition of professional responsibility as it's applied in the MCLE rules. In other words, topics like uh, the presentations like we're doing today qualify for ethics credit under MCLE rules. So we're going to talk about a couple different things today. We're going to start by talking about a little background about NLAP. Uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, some of the ethical rules that intersect between NLAP's work and, uh, and, and uh, attorney well-being. And then finally, we're going to talk about some learnings uh, from the first 25 years of NLAP's existence. So what do we help with? Well, uh, we can help with a, a variety of issues, uh, stress, uh, we all experience stress. Uh, stress at normal levels is, is healthy and normal. It what's, motivates us to get out of bed in the morning, go to work, provide for, for ourselves. Um, but stress can become chronic stress. It can become stress at levels that we don't feel like we have adequate uh, tools to deal with it. Uh, it can certainly start to not only affect our professional but our personal lives. Uh, untreated chronic stress can lead to burnout uh, as well as uh, a precursor to other types of mental health disorders. And so we have resources to deal with that uh, work-life balance, whatever that means to you, whatever balance you're trying to strike to help you, you know, hopefully achieve that. 
Uh, mental health disorders, the two most prominent in our profession are uh, anxiety and depression, uh, but you know, we'll help with any type of disorder, uh, bipolar, OCD. Uh, we've, we've helped assisted lawyers and law students with a number of those uh, types of conditions. Uh, drug and alcohol addiction, uh, certainly it's been something that's been part of NLAP's core mission from the beginning. We still, uh, you know, see a number of lawyers, judges, and law students uh, that need help in that area. Gambling addiction. Compassion fatigue is a, uh, a type of dis mental health disorder that typically arises in people in helping professions and particularly emotionally charged areas of the law like uh, juvenile law, family law, criminal law, uh, even things like uh, immigration law. And basically what happens in those situations is uh, being exposed to the difficulties and, and the traumas of our clients on a daily basis over and over again starts to have a secondary effect on the helper, in, in this case the lawyer. And so there are things we can do to help protect that from having a negative effect on us. And uh, we have resources around that. We've done a couple of different seminars on that as well. Uh, cognitive decline, you might see that in our older lawyers. Um, that's not to say that you know older lawyers shouldn't be practicing law. In fact, the majority of them are perfectly fine. Often they're the you know, smartest, brightest, most experienced mind in the room. Um, but statistically speaking, when you get over the age of 60, you know, the likelihood of uh, someone experiencing a cognitive issue goes up. And, uh, and from a percentage standpoint, statistical standpoint, uh, you know, we will have, based on the number of, of lawyers over the age of 60, some affected by a variety of, of cognitive issues. And then any types of other mental health issues or things that are affecting somebody's ability to practice law. Occasionally, somebody's calling us and they don't even know what's affecting them. They just know that they're struggling. And so we can have that initial conversation, kind of start guide them forward and figure out where to go from there. Uh, what, you know, how do we figure out uh, to get you going in a different direction? So a little history on NLAP. Uh, we started as a bar committee uh, back in the 80s, focused uh, predominantly on drug and alcohol issues in our profession at that time. Uh, became a formal lawyer's assistance program back in 2000 or back in 1996. Uh, with a part-time director, and then in 2002 uh, became a, uh, a lab program with a full-time director. Uh, the initial director, his name was Rick Allen. Uh, he served up until 2017 uh, when I took over this role. Um, our mission expanded when we became a formal lawyers assistance program to deal with things like mental health, gambling, cognitive loss, and also not just about avoiding the worst, but also promoting the best. So dealing with things like providing uh, healthy stress management, how do we deal with stress without turning to gambling and alcohol and drugs and other things to deal with the stress of our profession? Uh, Nebraska was the 34th jurisdiction to create a lawyer's assistance program. Every state has one now. They, they have varying degrees of resources. Some of them actually have uh, on-staff mental health professionals who can do initial assessments and maybe some initial treatment. Uh, many of them are like Nebraska where I'm, I'm the sole staff member, but I have a uh, amazing committee uh, of volunteers, uh, number over 70 now, and uh, the same confidentiality rules that apply to me apply to them, and uh, they help their colleagues in need. You know, they do it quietly, they do it respectfully and without judgment, and they're just there to help when needed. And uh, I should mention that uh, NLAP is jointly funded by the Nebraska uh, Supreme Court and the Nebraska State Bar Association. So that's a little history about who we are and kind of what we do. Um, so, uh, you know, this is also, I, I think, helpful to talk about kind of, you know, w the things that we do and the things that we're not. Um, and, and there is some confusion often uh, within, within the bar about, about these two roles. So we, we're here to help all lawyers, judges, and law students. You can have an inactive law license. You can even be suspended working towards uh, reinstatement. Our services are available to you. They're confidential, as we, and we're going to go over that rule in a moment. Uh, they're free, so we don't charge for in-lap services. Uh, if you seek out the help of a, of a third party, like a mental health professional or a doctor, you are required you know, to pay those expenses. We don't have, unfortunately, we don't have funds to pay those, um, but anything in-lap does is confidential and free. We uh, are typically voluntary, uh, and a small percentage of the uh, people we interact with, uh, they've been ordered either through a disciplinary hearing or through conditional admission through the Bar Commission. Um, to work with NLAP to address an issue, uh, but that's probably less than 5% of what we do. The vast majority uh, come to us voluntarily. Uh, it might be reluctantly, but they come to us uh, voluntarily, and, uh, and, and again, we 
kind of try to meet people where they're at and help guide them, you know, on a path forward if that's what they want. Uh, we do outreach and education, like this program we're doing today. I typically do about 12 to 15 CLEs a year on, on a variety of topics. I'm in the law schools multiple times per year, interacting with the law students, and uh, we also get the opportunity to get in front of the judges on occasion uh, to provide resources for them as well. Uh, and then we're also, we're not just here uh, to help people, you know, kind of that direct help to the, someone who might be struggling. We're also here to help someone who wants to help someone else. In other words, uh, if a coworker or a lawyer working for you or a friend in the profession, uh, it may be struggling, uh, you can come to us. We can talk through uh, how you may approach them. We can coach you uh, on that. Uh, if you want us to reach out proactively, we're willing to do that as well. And then uh, we also can help identify maybe the appropriate resources uh, to offer in those situations. What we're not is we're not part of uh, discipline. We're not part of regulatory, uh, any type of uh, regulatory council. Uh, we're not here to judge you. Uh, we're a help resource. Uh, discipline has uh, a really you know critical uh, job for our profession, but that's separate from what we do. Uh, we don't diagnose or treat, uh, but we will connect you with those treatment resources. Uh, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I'm not a mental health professional, although I do have some specialized mental health training. Um, and so usually that initial conversation I have with somebody, you know, we can kind of figure out maybe how to, how to move forward. Uh, occasion, they're not even sure what's necessarily causing uh, maybe the disruption in their life. Uh, we can kind of start talking that through and figure out, you know, where do you go from here? Or what's, what's a path forward? Uh, we're not a substitute for someone's uh, willingness to fall through with treatment or, or to seek treatment. Um, you know, we, we don't have a magic wand. Uh, you know, if someone's refusing to address a particular issue, there, you know, there's nothing we can do. Um, but if they have the willingness um, to address something, then again, we're going to be with them throughout that process, uh, guide them, support them uh, you know, in, in that process and provide that kind of long-term support mechanism, which has been shown to be uh, critical in terms of somebody addressing uh, most of the issues that come to NLAB. And we don't provide legal advice or legal representation. So I get about usually a couple calls a week if somebody who thinks the lawyer's assistance program uh, provides them the opportunity to find a lawyer. Uh, that's not what we do. That's, that's the Volunteer Lawyers Project or, or other resources within our profession. And uh, an occasion, it's, they tell us, hey, I talked to a law office and they told me to call the NLAP and you'd help me find a lawyer. That's not what we do. So please don't send us those calls. Uh, send them to the Volunteer Lawyers Project. A little snapshot on uh, who we helped in 2021. We interacted with uh, 82 individuals. Either they came to us or we, we proactively reached out to them. Uh, majority of them are lawyers, a uh, good number of law students and one judge. Uh, when you think about the proportion of, uh, you know, there's about 7,000 lawyers, about uh, 1,000 law students, and uh, about 140 judges in Nebraska. So those numbers, I think, work out pretty well proportionately. The number one uh, thing that people came to us for was substance use disorder, predominantly alcohol, that we do see some, some um, drug issues within our profession. Uh, Number two is mental health. And, and uh, before the pandemic, those two numbers were, were almost tied. And we did see a spike in substance use disorders uh, within, you know, within the uh, couple of years that we've been in the pandemic. Uh, and particularly among, um, you know, kind of two kind of core areas. One is among uh, women in our profession. Typically men have a higher rate than women of substance use disorders, but, but for whatever reason during the pandemic, it spiked among female lawyers. And also we had a number of people who maybe had, had been adequately addressing a substance use disorder, but based on some of the isolation and lack of resources and things during the pandemic, uh, maybe had a relapse and were struggling. And so we had to get them reconnected with the, with the right help. Uh, dual diagnosis would be having both a mental health and substance use disorder. Uh, stress, work-life balance, again, you don't have a specific disorder, but you're just, you're struggling in some way. Maybe it's a divorce, maybe it's a job change. Uh, maybe it's a physical health condition that's that's causing stress in your life. Uh, we can talk through resources to help you in those situations. And then cognitive decline and then the physical illness uh, kind of category or, or injury. Um, you know, we've had lawyers that have been in car accidents or come down with very serious phys uh, physical illnesses. And while we're not helping them with, with their physical care, there is a mental health aspect to being affected by one of those things. So we're there to help with that as well. So ethical rules that uh, intersect 
between uh, kind of, you know, um, to bring NLAP into the ethics uh, uh, discussion. The first is confidentiality uh, 3-501.6 uh, that we've added a paragraph in Nebraska. That's the attorney-client privilege rule in Nebraska. Hopefully all of you recognize that. And that same rule that gives you all privilege with your clients says a lawyer, judge, or law student, or prospective lawyer coming to NLAP for assistance gets the same privilege uh, and confidentiality over communications as any lawyer with client. So you all know how expansive that is. Uh, you, you know what the limits of it are, uh, how it can be waived or not waived. And so um, that's how we provide confidentiality protection for NLAP interactions in Nebraska. And then we have a sister rule. Uh, most lawyer, or lawyers in Nebraska uh, have an obligation to report another lawyer's misconduct to the extent it raises a substantial question to a lawyer's trustworthiness, honesty, or fitness to practice law. We have a carve out in that rule that says, uh, myself or my staff members or my volunteers uh, are not required to report misconduct that would otherwise be reportable uh, under 3-508. And that allows us to have kind of more open and frank conversations with people. As you can imagine, uh, at times a, a lawyer, you know, may have struggled to keep up with their practice or other things, uh, allows us to talk to them about that and, and help hopefully figure out a way to get them back on track. Um, without having to talk in hypotheticals or in code. And so uh, that's that's really helps us to have these kind of open and honest conversations. Uh, there is a rule that says that a judge, if a judge be, has a reasonable belief that a lawyer is impaired, the judge uh, shall take appropriate action, and that may include referral to NLAP. So we're included in that rule as well. And then finally, disciplinary counsel uh, has a rule that says if they come upon information through one of their investigations, that a lawyer may need assistance with a substance use, mental health, or gambling problem, they shall make that referral to NLAP. So with the judges, it's a may. Uh, with disciplinary counsel, it's a shall. And that's that's really helpful to us because honestly, um, you know, discipline is, uh, I have a, you know, Mark Weber and his office uh, have been a great resource for NLAP. Uh, they, they've notified us when they have concerns about a lawyer. They recognize it's a one-way street. Uh, if they make a referral to us, we, you know, based on our confidentiality rules, uh, cannot communicate back with them about any communication we may or may not have had with that person um, unless that person waives confidentiality to allow us to have that conversation. And so that helps us uh, hopefully to identify individuals who may need some help from NLAP. Um, the other ethical rules that come into play here, I think, in the in the attorney well-being uh, discussion are... Um, you know, at the top, we see the typical rules that, you know, a lawyer that may be impaired by uh, some type of disorder, um, be it mental health or substance use or, or cognitive, uh, duty of competency, diligence, communication. In other words, have you kept up with your practice? Have you kept up with communicating with your client? Have you done the work uh, that you need to do for that client? Have you missed deadlines? Um, you know, have things uh, been, been filed uh, timely? Are you constantly asking for continuances or missing deadlines, uh, those are kind of some of the warning signs we may see of a lawyer who may be affected by some condition. And then safekeeping of property, um, you know, th that would be the trust account typically. And unfortunately, sometimes in, in the more uh, severe cases, uh, a lawyer, you know, through a gambling addiction who dips in the trust account to cover a gambling loss uh, or through drug addiction dips in the trust account um, in order to buy drugs, thinking next week I'm going to put that money back from some settlement that I'm going to have come in, and then that settlement doesn't come in, and next thing you know, they kind of head down that spiral. So we obviously want to get to people before there is an ethical violation. We want it, we, we, we hope that people reach out to us for help uh, before that letter from discipline shows up uh, so that we can help them avoid that uh, from, from happening. Uh, but if it has happened or if it happens during the time in which we're interacting with them, you know, again, what's the best way to minimize the damage and uh, do the best you can for your client under those circumstances? Uh, the, the Supreme Court uh, has recognized that uh, through disciplinary cases that having a mental health or substance use disorder uh, is not uh, an excuse for an ethical violation. First of all, having those disorders by themselves isn't necessarily a violation, but often, again, based on those rules above, uh, somebody hasn't kept up with their practice or otherwise uh, has done things to violate some rule. Um, however, 
the court has recognized that if you are affected by one of those conditions and that contributed to whatever behavior resulted in the ethical violation, uh, going out and, and making a good faith attempt uh, to get diagnosed and to treat that disorder can be a mitigating factor. And in some cases has been a significant mitigating factor. Um, so the, the premise being number one, we wanna encourage people to go get help. So we encourage them by making that a, a mitigating factor. And then secondly, uh, we want to, you know, we, we recognize the fact that if somebody, for instance, had a, a severe depression and they weren't keeping up with their practice, uh, if they go out and adequately treat that depression, they're very capable of being a, you know, good, competent lawyer, and the odds of discipline seeing that person again uh, probably go way down. So um, that's how, on the disciplinary standpoint, uh, you see well-being kind of interact with uh, our ethical code. So uh, five key learnings from NLAP. We're going to end with this, um, and we're going to go through each one of these uh, separately. But uh, NLAP's been around for about a little over 25 years now. Um, these key learnings are not just from NLAP experience, but they're also from uh, a couple, three comprehensive reports uh, that came out in the last six or seven years. And, and the first, uh, there was a report in, in 2016 that looked, uh, it was a comprehen comprehensive report of over 12,800 lawyers surveyed in multiple jurisdictions, and, uh, and it really shined some light on some of the issues within our profession. Uh, the second one was a, a very similar report, but it looked at 3,400 law students and, and looked at some of the issues within the law schools. And then finally, uh, there was a report in 2020 that uh, looked at judges and, and the, some of the effects they're having on judges. So first learning, uh, we are not invincible. That, that lawyer survey told us that 23% uh, of lawyers were experiencing chronic stress. Um, that again, that stress, that's not normal levels of stress. That stress is starting to become overwhelming. Stress that they don't feel like they have adequate tools to deal with. It's probably having uh, some impact on both their professional and personal lives. Um, and 12% of those uh, lawyers in the survey admitted that they contemplated suicide during their legal career. And so that's really concerning. Better than one in 10 uh, at some point thought about suicide during their legal career. And I think um, the numbers at the bottom probably point to, you know, why that suicide number is significantly, or the, at least that the suicide idealization number is uh, significantly greater than what you'd see in the population, the general population. And that's uh, because we have a lot of untreated depression, anxiety, and alcohol use disorders within our profession. Um, you, you see lawyers compared to the, the adult U.S. population, uh, we're about twice as likely uh, to experience depression. We're about the same when it comes to anxiety, and we're about three times greater when it comes to alcohol use disorder. So we need to, uh, to recognize that we're, we're not doing well compared to the general public, uh, even though you know, we have often the financial resources, health insurance, and other things uh, available to us, we're still struggling. And, and um, there's probably a number of reasons why, uh, and we'll talk about a few of those in, in just a moment. But recognize that we're not invincible. We may need some help at some point, and we also need to be there to help each other. So again, about half those phone calls we get are, are, are somebody wanting to help a lawyer, judge, or law student who's struggling. Uh, and you know, a number of law firms are starting to adopt policies that I think are starting to change our, our help-reluctant culture to a help-seeking culture. Which leads us to our second learning, which is uh, stigma and culture within profession are still major barriers. Um, this isn't a, a you know a professional issue. This is also a societal issue, and uh, you know we we view mental health differently than we view, view physical health. And the example I love to give is, uh, you know, somebody walks in the office on Monday morning with crutches and uh, and a cast on their leg, and most of us feel pretty comfortable walking up and saying, "Hey, what happened?" Uh, what happened to your leg? What did the doctor say? You know, can I help you in any way? Um, we're, we're very comfortable talking often about physical health. Uh, same law office, somebody walks in and we understand that they, they've been diagnosed and are being treated for depression. Are we as equally comfortable walking up to them and talking to them about it, saying, what did the doctor say? What can I do to help? Uh, and, and the reality is we're not. And, uh, and again, that's not just lawyers, but certainly that occurs within our profession. 
And so we need to kind of be able to change our attitudes and views. I think that's starting to happen. And I think we're all becoming a little bit more uh, open about the idea that mental health isn't dis different from physical health and that we need to, to treat it uh, similarly. Um, our profession has also, you know, for a long time, uh, decades and decades, uh, embraced unhealthy approach to stress and mental health and alcohol consumption. Um, we're a pretty alcohol-centric uh, profession. We have a lot of offices that have, you know, bars within the, the actual office. Uh, you know, lawyers are expected to participate, to, to go to happy hour on Fridays and other things in order to fit in. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with drinking. We're not, uh, uh, NLAP is not the, uh, you know, prohibition society. Uh, but when we have events that, you know, a, a good example is a golf event. Alcohol served, but everybody's playing golf. You can be at that event. You can choose to drink. You can choose not to drink. Um, but when you have an event that's centered around alcohol, like a wine tasting or, or, or a, a whiskey tasting event or something like that, where you're telling people who don't drink, we don't, you know, you're, you're not really welcome at our event. Uh, those are the things that I think we need to start to shy away from. Uh, and then employers need to embrace the challenge and, again, adopt policies that, you know, promote help-seeking um, behavior. And I think there are a number of firms are moving in that direction, although I think still think they're in the minority. Some, it's, it's a resource issue. They just don't know how to do it. Others, uh, there's a reluctance um, based on the fact that, well, you know, this is the way we've always done things or, you know, the, the judgment of, well, maybe people just aren't cut out to practice law. And the reality is, is, is finding good employees and retaining them are, are critical factors for the success of a law firm and having good um, policies and procedures around promoting mental health in your firm uh, will help you in the long run retain and keep your talent. Learning number three, lawyers are very reluctant to seek help. Uh, in those same surveys uh, of the lawyers who screen positive for problem drinking, so that was the 28% of the lawyers, only 7% of that group uh, had ever sought any type of, of treatment for their alcohol dependency. So pretty low number. Uh, mental health, it got a little better, uh, a little over, uh, right around a third of the lawyers who were at high risk for a mental health disorder through that survey um, had sought any type of treatment. So obviously a major, minority of our, our uh, lawyers are not seeking treatment when, when probably they start to recognize they need it. Uh, some of that goes back to that learning number two and our culture that doesn't help them or doesn't encourage them to do that. Um, and then it's also, you know, like for for instance, with, with substance use disorder, you know, denial is, is a symptom of the disease. And so there's times where uh, the lawyer just, you know, they don't see it, even though everyone around them may see how it's affecting them, you know, professionally and, and personally. Um, and then we looked at the, at the bottom there, the common barriers for asking for help. Um, you know, confidentiality, privacy, I get it. There's privacy laws around, you know, obviously seeking medical care and insurance. Uh, confidentiality with NLAP. We've discussed that rule. You can come have a conversation with us and know that it's going to stay with us. Um, you know, finances, uh, you know, we a lot of us have those those great high deductible health insurance policies, and so that becomes an issue uh, at times. But, you know, the, the trade-off is, uh, you know, if you don't pay for it, often that you're going to end up losing a job or even losing your law license, which has a much greater financial impact. Um, and then, you know, just straight up kind of pride, keeping us from asking for help at times. We can help everybody else with their problems, but we are uh, reluctant to ask uh, for help on our own. Four, uh, people are willing to help you if you want it. Uh, NLAP's a great example of that. There's other help resources within our profession. Um, and uh, like I said, I, we have that amazing group of 70 plus volunteers uh, who are willing to help uh, and be there, encourage someone, uh, help provide them direction uh, through that help-seeking process. There's a lot of great mental health professionals within Nebraska, other types of treatment in Nebraska that we can refer you to. Um, and that's one, re you know, one of the resources that we provide our profession. Uh, you can Google, you know, therapist for depression and get 8 million results and not know what to do with that. Uh, if you call us, uh, we can, um, you know, identify individuals we think might be a good fit for you. Uh, maybe they've treated lawyers in the past. We've had good experiences with them. Um, you know, obviously that's one of the resources we want to have available to our lawyers, judges, and law students. And finally, learning number five, uh, progress takes patience and persistence, but it's very achievable. Uh, there are a number of success stories uh, that we've had uh, within NLAP where people have come to, come to us for help. 
Um, we've connected a number th with the right help resources, and they've been able to treat whatever condition or deal with their, whatever issue they may be facing. And uh, they've gone back to become incredibly productive. Some of them have become judges or heads of law firms or, or re-engaged in roles uh, like a uh, partner in law firm. Um, they've become successful trial lawyers, leaders within the Bar Association. And so um, there are some great stories. Now, the caveat is it takes time to treat these things. Uh, you hear, you know, the 30-day treatment center for drug and alcohol issues. Uh, it, 30 days is, 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 is not time to adequately address something. It's just the beginning. And so uh, if you know someone who's seeking help, give them, you know, the space and the time in order and continue to encourage them to stay engaged uh, with those help resources long enough that they can achieve some sustainable progress. And again, that's one of the roles that NLAP can play uh, is to be with them all through this process and, and hopefully keep them engaged in whatever is helping them. So there's our contact information. If you want to get a hold of me, uh, you know, take a quick snapshot of that uh, with your phone or go to the BAR website. We've just revamped that website with a whole bunch of help uh, resources on there for a number of areas uh, that we support. So go check that out. And uh, thank you again, uh, Scott Paul and Dave Summers for letting me be part of this program. Hello everybody, this is Scott Paul. I'm uh, dictating by Zoom or presenting by Zoom, the third uh, leg of the three-legged stool, if you will, uh, which is our uh, seminar in ethics and professionalism. Uh, this is the last year, hopefully, that we will be presenting by Zoom or by WebEx. Our hope is to be back in the Harper Center next, uh, next April and to be uh, conducting a live presentation at that point. Uh, and I, I should note that this is our 16th annual seminar on ethics and professionalism. It, it, I hopefully we'll follow the same format as we followed in the past. And if so, you'll be, you'll be watching my video or my presentation with this PowerPoint um, as the third uh, presentation in the uh, in the seminar. So uh, without further ado, we'll move on and uh, hopefully this will work well. I'm starting off with the, the partial definition of uh, professional responsibility. I, I get this from rule 3-401.2J. It's the definitions of the MCLE uh, rules that have been prom promulgated by the Supreme Court. I didn't put the whole definition up here, but what I did is I tried to focus on a couple of things, a couple of topics of professional responsibility that you're going to see in this presentation. Obviously, it applies to legal ethics. Uh, I think it can also make a very good case that some of these things relate to professionalism more than they do just the nuts and bolts of, it, of, of ethics. Um, one of the key factors that you're going to see in this presentation is malpractice prevention. That's part of professional responsibility. And so I think it's important for us as lawyers to be able to recognize how not to practice or how to avoid malpractice or prevent malpractice. Uh, and so that's what you're gonna see a fair amount of in this presentation uh, here today. Last but not least, we, the, the uh, definition focuses uh, on uh, uh, the professional responsibility duties of attorneys to the judicial system, to the public and to the clients. Of, of the attorney. And so what you're going to see here is um, kind of my shorthand version of how we, how we present this. And basically, lawyers are, are supposed to know the rules. They're supposed to follow the rules. And then when I say court opponent and client perception, what I'm referring to there is that the courts are going to expect you to do this. They're going to expect you to know what the statute of limitations is. They're going to expect you to know what the concepts of stare decisis are. You're going to hear a little bit about that later. Your, the court in particular is going to require you or expect you to know how to follow the rules of pleading, uh, how to follow the formatting rules and that sort of thing. Um, and not only that, your opponent is going to expect that. And, and if you don't follow the rules, you can bet that your opponent in any litigation is going to point that out to the court that you're in violation of the rules or you're not in conformity with the rules. Last but not least, it's a client perception. You hear a lot about the client satisfaction with lawyers and are they satisfied with their lawyers? Well, part of that perception is, is their lawyer following the rules? And if the client has to hear about the lawyer not following the rules, not, not 
doing things right according to formatting words, word, word processing, that sort of thing. Uh, you're, you're going to uh, have a client that's not a happy client uh, because the client's going to expect you as a professional to know how to do those things. So let me get, get into a little bit more detail here and show you what I'm talking about. There were some court rule revisions effective January 1 of 2022 that I think bear mentioning in, in this presentation. Uh, there's formatting requirements that are now apply to all motions, all petitions, all briefs, all pleadings, anything basically that you file with the court, these formatting requirements are going to apply. We find these rules in the uh, appellate court rules for the Supreme Court, but they are deemed to apply to all the trial courts, the district courts, uh, county courts, and so on. And so anymore, you're required to follow those rules for appellate briefing and appellate motions and all those sorts of things in terms of formatting. Those now apply at the district court level as well. So the court rule revisions uh, do contain uh, a, a grace period. I don't know that it's expressly stated in, in the, uh, the rules, but the clerks will not now, at least as of now, they won't reject a filing for non-compliance with the rules. On the other hand, uh, at some point that grace period is gonna go away. And what you don't wanna be in is in a position of asking the opposing counsel for a favor or asking the court for a favor by in terms of asking for, for leave of court to file something that doesn't comp comply with the rules or asking for leave of court to get a do-over so that your, your pleading or your brief does comply with the rules. Uh, the way I like to uh, explain it in terms of this type of situation to other lawyers or younger lawyers is that when it says leave of court and leave of court shall be freely given it's leave of court shall be freely given to the other guy. But when it's you and it's your ox being gored and when you're the one asking for uh, the relief from the court or an assistance from opposing counsel to agree to something or stipulate to something, you can't expect to get it and you shouldn't expect to get it. So if you always practice from the standpoint of the other side is always gonna give leave of court in, in terms of professionalism, you're always going to agree to certain minor accommodations to allow the process to move forward expeditiously those are all granted to the other side when it comes to you you have to expect that you, you will get none of those things and so keep that in mind in terms of the grace period that uh, is provided by the clerk's office here for compliance with the rules at some point that grace period won't be there anymore and you, you don't want to find yourself in a position of having to ask for leave of court to file something over or to get a do-over because you didn't comply with the rules the first time. So let's start with appearances. Uh, it used to be an appearance of counsel was accomplished by filing an answer. And whoever was on the signature block had appeared as counsel. That's not necessarily the case today. Uh, all appearances must be electronically filed. And so I think the, the better practice at this point is if you're going to file an appearance in the case, whether it be as a plaintiff or a defendant, go ahead and file a separate pleading called an appearance of counsel. Now, it should still be good enough that if you're filing a complaint that that, that constitutes an appearance of counsel. It should, it should probably be good enough if you're filing a responsive pleading or a motion to dismiss, that that should be good enough as an appearance of counsel. But make sure you're complying with this rule. Just take out any of those, those risks or those consequences file a separate document in each case as an appearance of counsel. It used to be we would file appearances of counsel just so that there was a, a appearance in the record so that there wouldn't be an, a, a default judgment entered against you if something happened or the other side was required to give you notice of something. Uh, that's not necessarily the case anymore as we work into these new rules uh, in the way that appearances are filed. Now, there is one exception and that is if there's a hearing uh, usually a, a, an early in the case hearing, obviously, a pre-answer hearing, journal entries will satisfy showing appearances of counsel. Or, for example, let's say there's a summary judgment hearing and there's a journal entry noting the fact that another lawyer from your office has, has, uh, is in the courtroom at counsel table and participating in the hearing. There, there may be a journal entry that the court makes to reflect that. And if so, that's going to satisfy the appearance of counsel requirement by the rule but you don't wanna leave it to the judge again. You don't wanna count on the judge being the one making that uh, compl compliance factor for you 
you want to go ahead and do the appearance of counsel. Uh, it also ensures that if you make an appearance of counsel that you're going to get uh, a uh, served with all future pleadings and orders in that case. So there are some word limits in it to, you know, it, it may come as a surprise to some lawyers that there are going to be word limits, but uh, they are here. They are here on appeal and now they are here in the trial court. So briefs may not exceed 15,000 words. Roughly, very roughly, generally, and generally speaking, that's about 50 pages, uh, give or take. And so if you think you've got 50 pages, give or take, uh, for your brief, and note that it, it applies to your reply brief too. So you've got to keep in mind that it, just as you would an oral argument, that if you're going to make an oral argument, make a presentation, you want to reserve something for uh, rebuttal. And in this case, you want to reserve a few pages, a few thousand words, or a few hundred words, whatever however the case may be, to the reply brief. Everything counts toward this 15,000 word limit. The TOC, TOA, what are those? The TOC is the table of contents. The T TOA is the table of authority and signature blocks uh, where you sign and it has your firm name. So those are all counted toward the $15,000 word or $15,000, the 15,000 word limit. Um, but there's one pleading or one document that you file or one part of the document that doesn't apply. And that's the certificate of compliance. That does not count in the word document. Now, if you're like me in your, your past 60, you don't know what a certificate of compliance is. The younger lawyers all already, I'm sure, are very familiar with these types of rule, rules, these types of uh, certificates of compliance. But what we're talking about here is a certificate of compliance is a particular document, and it looks like this. Here's an example. The undersigned hereby certifies the foregoing brief contains 4986 words. The undersigned relies on the word count function of Microsoft Office 360 Word version 2019. And so the beauty of this is that you don't have to pull, pull out your brief or pull out your pleading and start with the caption of the, of the pleading and then work your way through going on one, two, three, four, five. You don't have to count the words because this Microsoft Office version has a word count function. And it, it determines, it tells you how many words you have counting all of the certificate of service, uh, the counting the table of context and all those sorts of things. Um, but it does not count or you should remove from that count uh, anything in, in the uh, uh, certificate of compliance. But this is a great function to have. It allows you to keep uh, track of where you are in terms of word compliance. And if you've got almost 5,000 words, you're, you've got 10,000 words left. Some of that should be kept from a reply brief if you're the moving party, and if you're the uh, defending party, you've basically got another 10,000 words that you can, or you've got a total of 15,000 words that you can use to address what's a 5,000 word argument by the other side. You'll also note that on this, this certificate of compliance, it says the brief also complies with the typeface requirements of the court rules. And when they, we talk typeface requirements, we're talking about font, that sort of thing. We're, we're going to get to that in a minute. Certificate of service. It used to be that we would put a certificate of service on everything, that we would certify with our signature that on a certain date, an answer was filed or a pleading was filed or something, some document filed with the court was filed by certified mail, by sending a certified mail, or it was filed by uh, electronic mail such that email service was obtained. Anymore, those don't apply. The certificate of service is system generated. And what we mean by that is that the system will create a certificate of service. It gives you a format to follow. And you can see uh, when I go to the next page, the, the example of the format, it has I just inserted party number one, two, three, and four for, for uh, clarity purposes. You may not have that many, you may have more persons that need to be served, but it, it sets forth the bar number, it sets forth the service me method, which is electronic service, and importantly, it has the email address of the lawyer uh, who's receiving the, the, the service of the document. Let me come back to bar number. That's really the key number, because when you 
register with justice, which all of us as lawyers are registered, registered or required to register with justice. You have a situation where, let's see if I can do this. The certificate of service system is tied to appearances filed by all attorneys. So that's why it, it, there's, there's magic to having an appearance filed by the, the, uh, the lawyer uh, because it's tied tied to your justice bar number. And so the system knows that you have been entered in appearance and you will be getting ser served with this document automatically if, if you have entered an appearance. So there are two components. One is being registered on justice. The other is entering an appearance. And as long as those two requirements have been complied with, you're going to be in good shape to not only file things, but get service or get obtain service of documents from the other side. So and that's what the uh, thing I was just referring to is the bar number and service method is listed as electronic service to the council's email address. So obviously you can't get into justice, you can't register with justice with having, without having an email address and that's something that the system then knows and uses on your behalf. Paper briefs. Well, it used to be that pleadings were filed with the court, briefs were served on the judge, served on opposing the counsel. But, but unless you're a pro se litigant, the rules no longer permit per paper briefs to be used by litigants. Everything has to be filed with the court electronically. Uh, so <clears throat> the, the initial caution here is don't deliver an original brief to the judge. Why is that important? Well, if the judge is gonna be a stickler with the rules, and you file an original brief by delivering it to the court as opposed to electronically filing it and then the court getting the, the brief that in that fashion. The judge may say, well, I'm not going to read your brief. You didn't follow the rules in terms of how you should uh, serve it, how, how you should file it with the, with the court, with the clerk. If you can't follow the rules, I'm not going to read your brief. Well, that's a tremendous downside, obviously, for that to happen. You, it affects the, the strength of your case. And certainly it's, it's not anything you'd want your client to be thinking is that your lawyer can't follow the rules and can't get his briefs before the court. He doesn't know how to do that. Um, so that, that's a problem. And, and so you, you need to make sure you're following the rules with respect to paper briefs. Now, one of the rules, it's not in the rules, but courtesy copies are permitted. You can still send and after filing electronically a brief, you can still send a courtesy copy to the court. One of the things I would caution you on is that everybody's now governed by these rules. Everybody's electronic, electronically filing their brief. If you're sending courtesy copies in hard copy format, they're eventually gonna get lost by the court. The courts, as you've seen, Chambers and Douglas County District Court and the Hall of Justice, the judges don't have a, a lot of room. And so they don't have a lot of room to keep these briefs and so if you're going to do a courtesy copy, you should consider doing it by email so the judge has it electronically, maybe with a copy to the bailiff, so the bailiff knows that the judge has it as well. And that would be probably falling under the, the uh, ambit of good practices or best practices. Hyperlinks are not required um, to use, but they are permitted. But if you're gonna use a hyperlink, you can only hyperlink to Nebraska reports, Nebraska appellate reports, or to the legislative website. You can't hyperlink to Westlaw. And so while that might be very convenient for the opposing counsel and be very, very convenient for you, the court doesn't necessarily have access to Westlaw. And those hyperlinks may not uh, work if you're submitting them to the court in that fashion. And so uh, while Westlaw would be great to be able to get other states uh, at, at, the, at the case law at the click of a button uh, by clicking on a hyperlink, uh, you can only do that with limited, under limited circumstances in Nebraska. So just keep that in mind that uh, don't hyperlink to Westlaw, but hyperlink only to the, uh, the case law or the, the, the case sites uh, in Nebraska reports or appellate reports. All pleadings must be converted PDFs now, not printed or scanned PDFs. Again, <clears throat> for some of the older lawyers, we may, be, we, we may be saying, well, what's a PDF? Uh, the, the younger lawyers have, I'm sure, very good uh, knowledge of what that is. But I'll give you an example. Uh, if I get a brief and I, I want to send it out to somebody, 
it's not unusual. I go to my legal assistant and I say, will you send me this as a PDF? Now, I don't know what she does with it, but it can be one of two things. She could go to the copy machine and scan it and then create a PDF on the copy machine and send me that. Or the other thing she could do is go on the system. If it's a brief we created, the document we created, there's an easy manner in which that can be converted from a Word document to a PDF document. But that's really what this rule is, requ is requiring and what is referred to here. All filings must be converted PDFs. And so if it's a petition, if it's a complaint, if it's an answer, if it's a brief, it must be a, filed with the court electronically, but it has to be done so as a converted PDF. It can't be one of those printed and scanned types of PDFs. I don't know why the answer here, why, why, I don't know why that is the rule. I don't know the answer to that, but and just keep in mind that there is a difference between a converted PDF and a scanned PDF. And what the court system will accept is the converted PDFs. And it's a very simple function on a word processing uh, database for your legal assistant to do. Uh, so keep that in mind. I want to also extend my thanks to Alex Sheener here from the Graph North who pr pr provided the PowerPoint presentation on court re rule revisions. Uh, Alex was, was a big help to me in giving me a lot of the insight behind the uh, court rule changes and hopefully it was uh, some benefit to you as well. All right, let's move on to uh, Article 5 of the Nebraska Rules of Professional Conduct. And this is the, the section of the rules that talks about an attorney's duty to supervise. And you have a duty as an attorney, if you're a supervising attorney, to supervise subordinate lawyers. If you're the head of a firm, you've got a duty to supervise the lawyers in the firm. If you have a legal assistant or a paralegal, or if you have a law clerk uh, working for you or with you on a case, a lawyer has a supervisory responsibility over those non-lawyer assistants. What does that responsibility entail? Well, they got to comply with the rules, the rules of professional conduct. You, you can't do something as a lawyer that's in violation of the rules of professional conduct that, uh, you, that uh, you can't do it through your, your support staff that you can't do directly. So it's, it's a variation of the rule is of vicarious responsibility. Uh, and also that you can't do indirectly what you can't do directly. So you can't use the paralegals, law clerks, legal assistants to, uh, to do things that don't comply with the rules, whereas you wouldn't do that if it was you. So keep that in mind. All right, so what circumstances are we talking about here? Um, this is a, allow me to get in my soapbox for, for a minute. I'm gonna give you two scenarios. <clears throat> One nightmare scenario that I call it the six you're at the office at six o'clock on a Friday evening before a three day weekend. It was that Friday was the last day to file, let's say, an answer. And you had asked your associate to get it on file, but he's long gone uh, on, on vacation for the weekend and you can't get a hold of him on his cell phone. So you don't know if the pleading was filed or not. You, you, you don't know. Uh, whether something can be tracked in terms of whether the answer got filed or not. And so you could always re refer to your cheat sheet. And I'm going to tell you what I mean by cheat sheet in a second here. But one, one of the things you might want to find yourself doing in this situation is going ahead and filing the answer just in case. Because you don't know if it, somebody else filed it. You don't know if it got accepted by the system or not. And maybe the, the the, the better part of valor here simply to get the pleading on file and redo it. Well, do you know how to do that? And we're going to address that here in just a second. The second nightmare scenario I like to talk about is did my MCLE report get filed on time? This would be an end of the year type filing. But if, if you delegate the responsibility for MCLE compliance, your CLE compliance to your legal assistant or to a paralegal then you may not know if it got filed on time. They may have said it, it did, or may, they may have not have said anything to you. And as you're contemplating on the last day, whether or not it got filed on time, you may want to, out of an abundance of caution, go ahead and file it yourself again, perhaps, or maybe not for the first time, you just don't know. So better to get it on file and, and be, be able to prove that you were in compliance. Again, how do you do that? Will you refer to your cheat sheet? But what do I mean by cheat sheet here? And so basically it's a practice 
device or practice memo that, that you would have in your office uh, in, a, in a place where you know you could get access to it that would tell you how to create a pleading in a T, tell you how to create an MCLE report. It would tell you how to file it. It would most importantly have your ID and your passwords because it's amazing how many lawyers that use the justice system and use the MCLE reporting system don't know what their ID name is, their user ID name is, or they don't know what their password is because they have somebody else do it because they delegated that responsibility to somebody else. Well, you're still responsible for that being done, even though you've delegated that responsibility. The question I have is whether you can adequately supervise a paralegal or a legal assistant who's doing this work for you if you don't know how to do it yourself. Now, at a certain point, you have to rely on your legal assistants to, to do the word processing and, and comply with the rules, but you should have some basic understanding of what the rules are, what, what compliance is, is required, and so on. And so that's why I, I'm a big fan of sitting down with your legal assistant, who, whoever is in charge of doing your pleadings and getting them on file, or whoever's in charge of your MCLE report, if it's not you, it should, it should be you, but if it's not you, you sit down with that person and have them walk you through the steps and then ask them to create an outline. Give me a step-by-step -step outline of what to do if I'm here at the office at six o'clock on a Friday night and I gotta get something on file, how do I do that? How do I create the document? How do I file it? What are my user passwords, uh, my user ID, and what are my passwords? And then do the same thing for any type of MCLE requirement. It's less likelihood that you're going to run into a problem there, but still, you're the supervising lawyer. You ought to have some basis to understand how the, this work gets done, how these tasks get accomplished, and, and don't leave it to the hope that some associate has, has done the work, has filed the document. If you are, are, are not certain, if you can't prove that it got filed, and you're, you're wondering the better part of valor here is to go ahead and, and file another one or file it yourself just to protect yourself. And so in order to do that, you need to be able to work with your legal assistant and to be, be able to understand how this process works. And you've always got a cheat sheet then uh, that you can fall back on if, if you ever get into one of these nightmare scenarios. So let's talk about Supreme Court. Um, you know, obviously we, we talk about our ethics rules that are pro promulgated or by the Supreme Court of Nebraska and they're uh, listed in the Nebraska Rules of Professional Conduct. And most all of the 50 states have adopted the Rules of Professional Conduct in one form or another. So Lawyer, lawyers and state practicing in state court or federal court already have this, this body of uh, ethical compliance rules, but the Supreme Court justices regulate their own ethics. They, they have not created a defined body of ethics rules that applies to the court. And so for that reason, they, they're left to themselves to regulate their ethics on a case by case basis. And sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. So what am I referring to here? Our old friend, Dr. Grew, former Creighton Constitutional Law Criminal Procedure Professor, um, who I believe now lives in Arizona, continues to write for the Daily Record, uh, I think once a week. And he raises the, the, in the his April 6th column, he raised the, the, the question about Clarence Thomas. And in November 2020, for that election, and, the, and then again, the January 6th insur insurrection come, insurrection. Jenny Thomas, who's the wife of Clarence Thomas, texted White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows 29 times, urging him to stop, as she, as she called it, the greatest heist of our history. Well, one year later, Justice Thomas voted to block the release of the White House records regarding the insurrection, the January 6th insurrection. These records likely included the communications by email or text message by his wife. And so, the question that Dr. Drew has, and the question I have, is went too far there. Should Justice Thomas have recused himself from that that ruling, uh, from that vote on whether or not to, as the court says, uh, should he have participated in the vote to block the release of the White House records regarding the insurrection records that largely that likely included 
those communications by his wife. So you can certainly make the argument that he should have recused himself, but on the other hand, there were no rules or of ethics that required that he recuse himself. And since the adoption of the Federal Judicial Code in 1973, many people have asked, well, why doesn't the court have these types of protections, these types of ethical rules? And Justice Roberts has said, well, part of the reason is separation of powers. We haven't done it ourselves. We, we think we can regulate ourselves in-house, uh, but it's kind of murky in terms of how that's done, if at all. Uh, but one thing is, is sure that under separation of powers, Congress can't promulgate a set of rules that then it applies to the Supreme Court because that would be a violation of separation of powers. So the, the, the question is, is, has not been resolved. Um, and so it comes up in situation you may have heard recently, there's been a leak of a draft opinion in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health. That's the leaked opinion that arguably, uh, potentially uh, would over, overrule the Roe versus Wade decision. Well, what if a justice leaked that opinion? Uh, we don't know who leaked it. Uh, that hasn't been determined yet. It may, it may never be determined. But if a justice leaked the opinion, what ty types of rules would maybe violate? What types of sanctions would be available uh, against that judge? But more importantly, what about, we're back to the supervisory responsibility of lawyers and supervisory responsibility of judges. Don't they have the curious responsibility if their law clerk leaked it? If the clerk, clerical staff leaked it, is there some vicarious liability there or responsibility under the rules to regulate and supervise those clerks or that staff? You would think that there should be, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there is. And so that's one of the things that is lacking right now is this whole concept of supervisory responsibility. Justice Roberts may want to find out who leaked the opinion, but once he finds out who leaked the opinion or if he finds it out, what can he really do about it? Uh, I'm sure he has, as Chief Justice has certain inherent powers, but unless those powers are granted to the, to the court in the Constitution, in, in my mind, it's, it's an uncertain situation as to whether the Supreme Court has any rules that require them to do anything with respect to recusing itself from decisions involving uh, the January 6th insurrection and discovery matters surrounding that or in this investigation regarding the leak of the draft opinion in Dobbs. So uh, again, I reference you back to 3-505.1 and 3-505.3, where you have supervisory responsibility over your paralegal, your legal assistants, your subordinate lawyers. Supreme Court, you would think has that responsibility, but we haven't seen it yet in terms of any code of conduct. The individual clerk, uh, law clerks may have that responsibility by being a member of the District of Columbia Bar or the Virginia Bar or wherever they sat to uh, obtain their uh, bar license. While that may apply to them, it doesn't necessarily apply to the judges, justices themselves. So that's why I say arguably the Supreme Court staff could be regulated through other ethical codes, other rules of procedure from other states, but the, the, the ethical regulation of the court remains uncertain. So I mentioned the leaking of the elite opinion in Dobbs. And obviously we've heard a lot about that. Uh, we haven't heard much in terms of how it happened. We still really don't know how it happened. But uh, so you may be familiar with that case. National Public Radio called the case a quote, bomb at the court, end of quote, uh, that undermines everything the court stands for internally, institutionally, including the members trust in their law clerks and each other. Well, I. I agree it's a very serious matter to have a draft opinion leaked, but is it really a bomb at the court? Does it undermine everything that the court stands for? Uh, and I, I, would, I would submit that if there's no changes to that opinion, if the, the opinion has leaked becomes the actual uh, final draft of the opinion, then the only thing that's really happened as a result of its leaking is that it was made public before it was intended to be made public. Uh, but if that's if the leaked opinion turns out to be the, the final version and turns out to be the law of the land, uh, is it really uh, that big of a problem other than it was there's been a breach of trust perhaps and other than the fact that it was leaked earlier than what was intended for official publication. Um, but I, I wouldn't say necessarily it's a bomb at the court, at least based on what we know at this point. 
So is it, we've heard that the leak is unprecedented, uh, but is it really? Uh, several books have been written that address the inner workings of the Supreme Court. And I haven't gone through and tried to list them all, but the one that maybe is, is the most well-known is Bob Woodward's book, The Brethren, Inside the Supreme Court. And this was the first detailed behind the scenes account of the Supreme Court in action. And there was a hue and cry at the time this, this book was published because it was looking behind the, uh, the, the, cur the curtain as it relates to how the Supreme Court does its work, uh, how it uh, decides cases, how it just re regulates the day-to-day -day activity of the court. Uh, but that was a very uh, comprehensive look at the court. And so I don't know that we can necessarily say that the fact that the, the Dobbs opinion was leaked is necessarily un unprecedented because um, as Amazon.com says, uh, the Brethren was an unprecedented view of the chief and associate justices and their maneuvering and arguing and so on. So if, if that was unprecedented, certainly what happened with the Dobbs opinion can't be deemed to be unprecedented. We you know, we've been talking about leaked opinions. And did you know that there were two previous leaks of Supreme Court opinions? And you may or may not know that, but then did you realize or did you know that those opinions were actually in the original Roe Ro versus Wade opinion, those leaks? were actually in Roe versus Wade. First, the, the Washington Post published a story in uh, inc including a June 1972 memo from Justice Douglas to his colleagues. Again, looking behind the curtain, seeing how judges interact with one another. And that, that, that memo from Justice Douglas uh, in 1972 regarding Roe versus Wade was leaked by, by somebody and it was published by the Washington Post. And you don't hear much about that, but you hear about how uh, this, this leak was unprecedented in the Dobbs case, but arguably what happened in the actual Roe versus Wade opinion uh, was, was just as bad or just as, as unprecedented as anything that happened in Dobbs. Uh, and then another leak, again, in Roe versus Wade happened when Time Magazine published the final decision in Roe before it was officially the final decision. And this has occurred because of a, of a bit of a, a slip up, but an hour before the clerk was due to announce, the court was due to announce the Roe opinion, a clerk told Time Magazine, again, on background, so it was confidential, that it was only to be reported once the opinion came down from the court, but the ruling was slightly delayed, but it didn't delay Time Magazine. They went ahead and issued the story uh, and it hit the news uh, newsstands a few hours too soon. And as a result, the Time Magazine had scooped the Supreme Court on the Roe versus Wade opinion. So when we hear about leaked opinions, it's one thing to say, well, that's, it shouldn't happen. And what about the court's responsibility to police those leaks and that, that sort of thing? And we, we certainly understand that, but it, it was certainly not unprecedented when you've got two other leaks happening on Roe versus Wade um, earlier back in 1972. Uh, it's ironic, in fact, that those leaks occurred on Roe versus Wade, and now we have another leak uh, on the Dobbs opinion that may or may not be a leak of the final uh, uh, published opinion of the court. Uh, Chief Justice Warren Berger was furious as a result of the leak and demanded a meeting with the, time, the editors of Time Magazine. Uh, and so he began a, the investigation of other justices. And that, that's, if that sounds familiar, it should. It's very similar to what Justice Roberts said he was doing in the in the Dobbs case in terms of trying to get to the bottom of the leak. They they actually found out who ten, who did the leak in in the Time Magazine uh, situation, and that 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 um, Walker tendered his resignation. Justice Lewis Powell refused to accept it. He, he claimed the law clerk had been double crossed by Time Magazine, so there was no uh, any there's not any. Uh, consequences for that law clerk uh, to, at the Supreme Court at least, to have uh, leaked it to, to Time Magazine. Justice Powell refused to accept the resignation and we're not aware of any uh, actual uh, enforcement or discipline that was meted out to that law clerk. So arguably, as I mentioned, the Supreme Court staff can be regulated through other ethical codes, state ethics rules, uh, where, those, where the law clerks in particular are uh, uh, members of the bar of, uh, 
for example, the District of Columbia or the, the state of Virginia. But absent the regulation of, of those lawyers through their own law clerk ethics codes, uh, we, we don't see there's any basis uh, that there's any basis for the Supreme Court to regulate itself, whether on vicarious ethical responsibility or their individual duties and responsibilities uh, under professional responsibility. And so it's something to keep an eye on, but it, the court is reluctant to, to set forth its own ethical codes that everyone ad adheres to. And we may not see anything too soon as it relates to news on this from, uh, from the Supreme Court on the on the ethics front. All right, so, uh, you know, one of the things that I've done over the course of the years, years, and I can't believe it's been 16 years now, is I've given you a, a glimpse into what's going on, going on with other um, lawyers in terms of their advertising. And th this is an odd advertisement, but I thought it was worthy of, of your consideration just to see what's out there. I'm going to show it to you and then uh, uh, we'll, I'll just discuss it a little bit. But suffice to say, it's not anything that I would uh, uh, recommend that any lawyer uh, engages in as a TV commercial. Let's hope this, this works here. on you like walkers on fresh flesh. If you've been hurt in a car wreck, call the law offices of Scott Foster and schedule your free consultation today. Well, it's really kind of hard to justify something that ridiculous as, a, as an advertisement for a lawyer, but this Scott Foster in Kentucky uh, created this, this commercial, this advertisement, this commercial, and, and wanted it to run during the Walking Dead uh, TV show. Um, so that was where perhaps he got his inspiration, but it puts lawyers in a bad uh, light. It, the public has to be shaking their head when they see lawyer advertisements like this from lawyers. Even worse, if you'll, if you'll notice, when you, if you go back and look at this, um, the, uh, the zombies, if you will, uh, several of them had insurance written on the front of their, their, their shirt. Uh, so if you couldn't figure it out, uh, the, the lawyer with the crossbow that came to shoot the arrows was shooting at the insurance companies. And uh, it, it's gross, uh, it's inflammatory, it's in, in, in extremely poor taste. Uh, but there again, under our ethics rules uh, now, you can get away with this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, it's unfortunate that that's the case. Uh, but the, the lawyer apparently saw value or benefit in trying to get this uh, produced in, in, the, in the way that it was produced. And uh, ho hopefully he will do well uh, while not injuring the uh, reputation of any other Kentucky uh, plaintiff, plaintiffs or personal injury lawyer. lawyer. So I thought it, you would feel, uh, thought you would uh, find some benefit in that. All right, so let's move on. A brand new case that just came down from the Supreme Court last month, uh, or this month still, I guess, is uh, the uh, Castrogen opinion. And it, I just point this out because it's something the Supreme Court has done just recently. It implicitly recognized the impact of intimate partner violence as a mitigating factor in attorney discipline. Uh, the record showed uh, that the medical evidence uh, established that the lawyer was affected by numerous mental and emotional traumas relating to sexual assault and domestic partner violence. Uh, the court, in a surprising move, move uh, actually reduced the length of the suspension. The referee said suspend the lawyer for 48 months. The court, the court said, no, we're, we, we think that suspending the lawyer for only 30 months is sufficient here. Uh, the, the court relied on other states for the intimate partner violence concept and included that intimate partner violence as one of the extraordinary mitigating factors that supported the reduction of the suspension. 
the, the, the main thing I think that comes to this is that there's a, now there's another factor. Depression used to be, and still is perhaps the most prominent, uh, prevalent uh, mitigating factor in any lawyer discipline. Uh, but now there's this uh, intimate partner violence that is also recognized as a mitigating factor. The key here though is that there was a healthcare provider that testified at the, at the hearing on behalf of the lawyer at length in terms of the lawyer's mental health, in terms of the effect of this violence on the lawyer's ability to practice as a lawyer. And it was ultimately the record that made the, the court's decision easy here, or, or at least made the, the court's decision possible. It's gonna always be a case-by-case -case application, but just keep in mind that if you do have the, the intimate partner violence issue, if you're representing a lawyer before the Supreme Court on a disciplinary matter, Make sure you make your record. Make sure you've got a healthcare professional that's backing you up on it. Let's talk about the principle of stare decisis. I'm going to start to move through this fairly quickly um, because I will tell you at this point, we don't know what the court's going to do on some of these cases. Um, we, I would like to tell you that stare decisis is still the, the rule here. Uh, but in the most recent case in Bogue versus Ellis, which was a case that was handed down earlier, I believe in April or May of this year. Uh, the, Justice Pappy in, in writing for the court said, while the doctrine of stare decisis is entitled to great weight, it's grounded in the public policy that the law should be stable, fostering equality and predictability of treatment. Well, I think everybody can agree with that part of it. He then noted, that it's one thing to note the justification for an established legal doctrine is, is questionable, but it's quite another to overrule that doctrine. And then he went on record by, again, confirming the stare decisis is entitled to great weight in our judicial system. Well, that's comforting. So that if you've got a case on appeal and, and you're, you're seeing that the court uh, has an opportunity to decide the case based on existing precedent, you should be in pretty good shape. That's not necessarily always the case, though, because notwithstanding Justice Pappick's statement on stare decisis, and that since 2017, the court has deviated from precedent and overruled at least 17 cases on various matters, such as final order doctrine. Uh, but we, we see it in, in uh, medical malpractice cases as well as we're going to get to in a minute here. But just the fact that, that there's been so much, uh, so many cases that have been overruled, and that this may not be all of them. I, I did not intentionally do a comprehensive search to find all the cases that may have been overruled it could be more than 17, but we know that at least in these cases, uh, Heck, the Heckman versus Markio, I think that was a final order case, that overruled four cases. The McEwen case overruled five cases on a different matter. And now the Bogue versus Gillis uh, on medical malpractice statute limitations overruled eight cases. So it's something to be very much aware of that stare decisis, it may, may not be everything it was cranked up to be. And overruling precedent, Justice Papik in the Bow case said, we've also recognized that overruling precedent is justified when you want to, want to eliminate inconsistency or where there's an intrinsically sounder doctrine that better serves the values of stare decisis. So those are the, key, the situations where the court's going to look at stare decisis and say, okay, uh, you can't necessarily assume that it's going to apply. Uh, do we overrule precedent to avoid inconsistency? Do we overrule precedent to get an intrinsically sounder doctrine? And whether something is intrinsically sounder uh, could be the subject of great debate between lawyers that are before the court. Um, and there, there again, that's where stare decisis comes into play. You would like to be able to rely on it. But all I can tell you at this point and the purpose for me raising this is to be careful. Uh, be careful if you've got a case in, in involving statutory interpretation uh, final order doctrine, certainly in, in, in malpractice uh, statute of limitations. And I say malpractice, I mean legal and medical malpractice statute of limitations. The law could change depending on the composition of the court, depending on the issue. And I can get into that in a little bit better detail to give, give you some indication of what I'm talking about here. Uh, statute of limitations in professional negligence cases. One of the questions that I've always had is, is there a difference between a lawyer's doctrine of continuing representation and the continuous treatment doctrine for doctors, for medical professionals? 
should there be a difference or should there be one rule that applies to both? And I just I point, point this out as an alert because it's an area where existing case law, stereo decisis, may be overruled or distinguished in order to achieve this consistency at some point in the future. I, I commend you to the Donlinger versus Nelson case. It was a legal malpractice action where uh, there was a deadline that was blown by the, arguably by the lawyer. Uh, the court held the district court did not err in ruling that the continuing representation exception did not apply and that the appellant's action was time barred. And I think in that case, they discovered it uh, while the, the, the negligence, while the opinion or while the lawyer continued to represent them. And so the court said, therefore it does not apply. Uh, the continue, continuous representation exception does not apply. So uh, the court held if a claim for legal malpractice is not to be considered time barred, the plaintiff must either file within two years, which we understand is the rule, or the time for filing has been told pursuant to the continuous representation rule. So clearly the continuous representation rule is not found in section 25-222. It's a, it's a a doctrine that's judicially created. It's not in the statute. And so that's one of the things that bothered uh, Justice Papik, as we'll see in a minute, uh, is what do you do in that type of situation? Supreme Court noted that it had limited reach of the continuous representation rule by holding that the continuity does not mean mere continuity of the general professional relationship. And what that means there is if there was an error created by the lawyer in the attorney-client engagement and the engagement continued on on a general basis or unrelated to that error, uh, that's not going to extend the statute of limitations. But if, it, if it's directly related to um, the representation provided by the lawyer and that continues throughout the engagement, the, the court is going to adhere to and, and apply, at least for now, the continuous representation rule. Uh, it also, it, it does it does not apply where the claimant discovers the alleged negligence prior to the termination of the relationship there. And that's what happened in the, uh, the Bogue versus Gillis case. But so continuity and discovery are, are key issues here. And there is a discovery component in, in the malpractice rule uh, or statute. But the bottom line here is that we just don't have the confidence based on what Justice Papik was said in the Donlinger case which is a legal malpractice case, whether it's going to apply in the future in medical malpractice cases under that statute of limitations. What I mean is just as Pappy in the Donlinger case was concerned that the continuous representation doctrine was inconsistent, noting that it wasn't in the statute. And when a statute specifically provides exceptions, the court won't judicially recognize any other exceptions, but that's exactly what the court has done in both the legal malpractice realm and the medical malpractice realm is it's recognized a continuous treatment or continuous representation exception. However, however the, the terms which define those continuous representation or treatment exceptions are different, whether you're a lawyer or whether you're a doctor. And so one of the things that I'm concerned about here is whether there's going to be a, a movement by the court at some point to make those, di those uh, distinctions the same those definitions the same if you're going to justify having the continuous treatment slash representation doctrine apply at all in the future. And so if Justice Papik's concurrence in the Donlinger case was to be reflected by a majority opinion, stereo decisis would no longer apply and the continuous representation rule would no longer be recognized. So that's another concern that we've got here. Again, I, I don't have the answers, but it's this is an alert because it deals with medical deals with legal malpractice. Um, and that is, if it's, it was up to Justice Papik in the Donlinger case, we wouldn't have the con continuous representation rule in, in 25-222. Yet Justice Papik wrote the opinion in, in Bobby, or in, in, the, in the Gillis case, the Bogue versus Gillis case in 2022, and he continued to breathe life into the continuous, the continuous treatment continuous treatment doctrine uh, so that we, you know, we're not quite sure where he stands on this. For lawyers, he'd get rid of it perhaps, yet for doctors, he'd allow it to, uh, to stand. And because there's a concurring opinion and then a majority opinion written by Justice Papik, 
he's the one to watch on this issue in the future. So he said, uh, any reconsideration of the doctrine of stare decisis should be, it should begin with whether the absent, uh, whether the doctrine should be recognized at all absent legislative action. So again, he wrote that in a concurrence two years ago. You need to be concerned about that as to where it's going. I mentioned the Bow case, which is the case that Justice Papik um, had entered or had written the opinion just this year. And th there was some issue there as to whether the statute of limitations in the Nebraska Hospital Medical Liability Act applied or whether it was in the professional negligence statute of limitations. 44-28-28 and 25-22-22, both of those are identical in all material respects, which is another factor that should be taken in consideration here. You, if you had different statutes of limitations and, and they, they were different in material respect, you could perhaps justify why the court treated lawyers one way and doctors another way. But if they're identical in all material respects, it's more, much more difficult to justify why a uh, doctor sh doctor's continuous treatment exception case should be distinguished or treated differently than a lawyer's continuous representation case. Again, Bogue writing in, or excuse me, in Bogue, Justice Patrick was writing for the majority, reaffirming cases, holding that continuous, continuous treatment doctrine applied. Basically what, the, what he said there was, it, it's, it's going to apply if there's been a misdiagnosis or whether there's incorrect treatment given based on that misdiagnosis, but we're not going to just apply it and say that it, it, end, it runs to the end of the relationship because the relationship could go on for years uh, unrelated to the actual alleged negligence. So the, the, the doctrine of continuous treatment was scaled back in the Bogue case by Justice Papik so as to not be as comprehensive as it previously was. And in so doing, the court disapproved of eight cases which held that the statute of limitations in a medical malpractice action starts to run upon the conclusion of any treatment related to the alleged act or omission forming the basis of the claim. So now it used to be the patient could wait until the end of treatment for having the statute of limitations begin to run. Now that's not the case. You need to look at the, the actual act or omission forming the basis of the claim. So how does the Bogue opinion square with the Don Langer opinion, which Justice Papik was writing on, on both of those? There are more questions than answers here. Um, and there's likely to be more, more law to be made here, whether stare decisis will continue to hold the day as it relates to legal malpractice. We don't know whether there will be some, some combination of legal malpractice and joint and, and medical malpractice as it relates to the statute of limitations. That remains to be seen, uh, but it's something to keep your eye on. It's obviously, these are two cases that need to be read if you have a legal malpractice or a medical malpractice case, because you need to try to figure out where the court's going on this, because right now we just don't know yet. All right, fastest five minutes in ethics. Let me run through this quickly. Uh, this is a Utah Supreme Court case, uh, which the Utah Supreme Court had an occasion to comment on the ethics of, of a judge, a sitting judge. It is an immutable and universal rule that judges are not as funny as they think they are. If someone laughs at a judge's joke, there's a decent chance that the laughter was dictated by the courtroom's power dynamic and not by the genuine belief, it should be belief, that the joke was funny. What we see here is the ethics awareness tip uh, given out by the Utah Supreme Court cautions judges to second guess themselves when they feel the, the, the very human temptation to tell a joke or err on the side of being too sober-sided rather than risking ill-conceived humor that may cause others to believe the judge isn't taking his job seriously. So just keep in mind that uh, if you're a judge, um, Utah Supreme Court thinks there's a risk here. And uh, I, I, for one, think there's great benefit in judges uh, using their sense of humor sometimes to diffuse situations or to uh, comment on, on the matters before them because sometimes they're very insightful. So I've always been a, a fan of uh, the appropriately placed judge uh, joke. And the, but apparently the Utah Supreme Court was uh, a little bit less, uh, a little bit more reluctant to engage in that, that type of approval. 
I uh, just wanted to point out to you the proposed amendments uh, to 3-508.4. That's the misconduct rule uh, in Nebraska and in the rules of professional conduct. It's what I've referred to in the past. You may recall I've called it a sledgehammer. That is the, the, the rule that most lawyers get disciplined on when there is discipline to be meted out uh, regarding attorney conduct. And the proposed amendments here were, were based in a survey conducted by the women in the law section. Those results indicated that more than 80% of the respondents believe that gender-based inappropriate conduct, harassment or discrimination or biased behavior occurs in the Nebraska legal profession. That's 80% believe that out of the, uh, the responding per persons to this survey. And nearly 70% actually reported having experienced or witnessed this type of behavior. Well, when you get to those types of uh, statistics, it's not a surprise that there was a move to clarify and ex perhaps expand 3-508.4. And so in consultation with the Nebraska Supreme Court Council for Discipline, uh, there was a proposed amendment to 3-508.4 to more specifically prohibit harassment and discrimination in an attempt to address this issue. And the uh, House of Delegates last year, last, last October, voted to petition the Supreme Court to consider the proposed revisions. And we haven't heard anything from the Supreme Court yet, but basically those revisions now say to whether the acts constitute harassment or discrimination uh, and whether it adversely reflects on a lawyer's fitness to practice law should be de determined after consideration of the seriousness of the act, whether it's part of a pattern or prohibit con prohibited conduct, or whether it was connect committed in connection with the lawyer's professional activities. So there was a real concern in, in that discussion about whether or not the, the uh, the conduct of the lawyer was within the scope of his practice or whether it's purely personal conduct and the uh, rule attempts to address that issue. There again, the Supreme Court has not ruled on that uh, amendment yet. Right now, the, the rule has not been amended. It is simply uh, the comment period that the Supreme Court put the rule out there uh, for ended earlier this month of May of 2022. So now the ball is in the, the, court, the, the uh, court of the Supreme Court and we'll see if anything uh, comes of a potential uh, amendment. But judging by the statistics that I just showed you on the screen, it seems like it's, it's certainly appropriate for uh, some amendment to be made to the rule to encompass this type of misconduct by lawyers. Last but not least, the elephant in the room. This, this is a real case. The New York Court of Appeals are going to rule later this year to determine whether a writ of habeas corpus should be granted because the, there's an elephant kept at the Bronx Zoo that has effectively been imprisoned in the zoo's one acre facility. So it's come to that. Lawyers are now filing lawsuits on behalf of animal rights organizations claiming that uh, animals in zoos are being imprisoned uh, and they, they deserve the same rights as persons. Apparently what, what this lawyer argued on behalf of the Non-Human Rights Project was that the elephant was cognitively complex and autonomous and worthy of the protections afforded humans. So I, I don't know that that's necessarily the case. That's certainly not one of uh, the shining lights that I would like to have, to have shine, shined on lawyers in terms of some of their legal arguments. Uh, it seems to be a little bit specious if you ask me, but it's one of those things that uh, these lawyers apparently uh, deeply believe in their animal rights uh, argument. And so they have uh, made that argument to the court. We'll see what the court has to say. I, I, I have a hard time believing the court is gonna rule in their favor. So what have we learned? Well, stare decisis, the necessity for the doctrine depends on the wishes of the court. You know, no matter what the court has said about stare decisis, it's one of those things that you, you need to be always concerned about whether the court is going to overrule precedent and rule against you. And last but not least, while it may be a good idea to laugh at the judge's jokes, make sure the judge joke is joking before you, you go ahead and start laughing. So that's what we've learned. Hopefully you learned a little bit about this, so this area of the law. Uh, hopefully you, you've learned a little bit uh, about the judicial ethics issues that we've uh, tried to address here today, and, and particularly the statute of limitations issues. Uh, I, I breezed through that very quickly. Um, but here in Nebraska, I, 
I'm concerned that stereodecisis may not be over yet uh, or, or may not control the future as it relates to some of these rulings on uh, legal and, and lawyer, lawyer and doctor malpractice issues. Uh, it just seems as if there's more to come. Uh, and so while I, I can't really predict what the court's going to do, I, uh, hopefully I've given you some indication of some things to be aware of, uh, some red, red flags that we should be concerned about if you have these issues before the court. That's all I've got for today. I appreciate everybody's time in, in terms of uh, participating in the seminar, and we hope to see you in April at the Harper Center for the 17th Annual, annual Seminar. Thank you. Thank you.